we have a lot to cover, so I want to go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, welcome to the new year of more business than we can possibly begin to comprehend sometimes. Um, and thanks for, for making it here. Um, we have so much ahead to look forward to. And I think that uh, taking on the activities that we have will turn out to be somewhat of a challenge, but an exciting and interesting one. So I'm looking forward to it. Do we have any public comments? Any submitted public comments? Okay. Uh, we need to approve the agenda, but I have one addition to the agenda. Uh, we really need to get the bylaws out of the way. And we have uh, posted them and sent them out. We sent them out twice in September and then again in November, immediately after our November meeting. We we'll discussed them briefly. I, we received one comment, and um, Diana here? Yes, she is. Uh, and uh, it seems the bylaws are pretty much okay with most people. We made a few changes. As we said, we would consult with Kendall, and Carlton and I have done so via email. Um, so we will be going over those briefly, and we will take a vote so that the HR, TPO, and PDC can uh, vote on them also, because they are our final approving bodies. So uh, we will add that to today's agenda. and. Um, we will try to keep that as brief as possible because we have a couple of presentations we're going to take some time. Are there any objections to the addition? No, I don't have any objections to your addition, but I was questioning. We at our last meeting we talked about the pipeline, and uh, we were going to get some more updates from the gentleman that did that for us at the last meeting. Which I just had. Oh, all right. I don't Of that and we talked about the HOV lanes. You were opening them up and if there were going to be new tolls and stuff like that. So it, that's we'll, all we'll good. Under, yeah, yeah, under under all good. I we'll just take that under perfect. Business. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Um, we do have Waverly is our newest member and she had not yet been approved at the last meeting, so I gave her a homework assignment. So you have three minutes to tell us about yourself, please. Okay. Well, I'll try and do it in less. <laughs> okay. Um, I am a native. Here uh, to Virginia Beach, Virginia, born and raised, and uh, well, of course, first of all, thank you all very much for allowing me to join you, and Happy New Year to everyone. I look forward to 2020. Um, I've been a volunteer and a business owner and a mom, uh, volunteering, as I think Kendall put out at the JCOC. I usually made my son do that volunteer work for punishment because he didn't do his homework. Um, but it was very good for him too, so he needed to get his hands dirty. Um, my family's here, um, and I, uh, I have a passion for small businesses and helping them flourish. And I definitely think that we need to have our communities come together so that we can have the, you know, our community support business while business is supporting our communities in every aspect. So I, I hope to bring that conversation to the table too. Thank you very much. I did not see that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we also have a new pending member, and that's Brandon Carver over there. And you don't have to talk about yourself today, but that's your homework assignment for the next week. Okay, I'm okay. happy to. Well, no, we usually do that after the after the HR PPO and PDC. Perfect. Sounds yeah. good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, I assume everybody's had a chance to read the minutes. Are there any corrections or changes to the minutes? Okay, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Anybody opposed? I have to say I wasn't here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then we have approval. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll go ahead with the HRPDC public participation plan. And I'll work the bylaws in as um, the next very nice year. So, can we go ahead with that? Hold on, Terry. Kendall's going to be doing that presentation. Oh, it's Kendall? Okay. 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 I have to go see it in private. This is the public participation. Yes. Okay. So um, you, you 
this is a really good day. And so like today, today's meeting is actually the you know, first meeting we've had that we're going to see in practice what we change to and, and, and what this is all about. So we're going to get presented with Jamie's study, with, which they'll see on the pedal of his office on a consultant and as well as all the initiatives that Bob and Keith do. And so I'm not going to do this to you in terms of the PowerPoint presentation. We're not going to do it. Okay? But you're going to get some heavy PowerPoint presentations that are beautiful. So I just want to take two minutes to pay to say that we have a draft public participation plan for the HRPDC, our sister organization, um, that is currently out for public comment. And the draft public participation plan is a, little, a lot like the HMTPO public participation plan which you voted to have the board approved. The only difference is that we have yet to show major initiatives that have been completed, whereas in the TPO public participation plan, we'll talk about the AFPP and other public programs that we have not. In this case, we're talking about our vision for public participation. It is the same level of commitment to the region. It is the same process as the TPO. What I was wondering if you could do is two things. Of course, please offer me really a seat about this, because you guys always do know that. I'd like you to read it and remember everything that Bob has. What did you call me? That guy? <laughs> 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 Do we approve the agenda? 
Yeah, actually, yes, we did. We, we did. did. Yes, we did. I didn't take a formal vote. Yeah. I asked if there were yeah, any. Yeah. I, I, I think it's okay that we're running ahead because we've got a heavy um, topic with regards to all of the initiatives that all of us are doing. And I want to make a lot more type of feedback on the 757 initiative, etc. All your feedback that you share with us. So let's go. And I think there will be more time in the Yeah. So is it okay? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. My name is Ben McFarland. I work in the Water Resources Department of the HRPDC. I manage our coastal zone management and coastal resiliency programs, and I also have the pleasure of working and managing our uh, joint land use study projects that we've been working on with the Navy in several cities over the last several years. So today I'm uh, going to brief you on the, the results of one of the completed studies. We just finished this one late last year in Norfolk and Virginia Beach, and I can also answer some questions you may have about our uh, ongoing study with the cities of Portland and Chesapeake. But I'll focus on this one since we've actually done the project, and the other one is still very much in the nascent stages. Uh, so a little bit of background. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with these studies, um, but for those that aren't, uh, these are efforts that are meant to bring together communities and military installations to address issues that are affecting the operations and readiness of those installations. Our region has um, quite a bit of history with doing these types of projects. About 15 years ago, uh, there was a study that this organization managed uh, that looked at the airfields, the Naval Airfields and Southampton Roads, so Chambers Field and Naval Station Norfolk, uh, Naval Station or Naval Air Station Oceana, and also uh, Fentress uh, Naval Auxiliary Landing Field in Chesapeake. Um, that was uh, came out of, uh, or at least was directly related to the BRAC process, the base realignment and closure process that took place 15 years ago or so. Um, obviously, in that case, there was a big, uh, big deal with dealing with the encroachment of the airfields. Um, and as a result, uh, that, that study actually had quite a lot of positive impact in terms of the building relationship between uh, the cities and the Navy and, and the state in working towards a collaborative solution to addressing those challenges. It really resulted in, a, in quite a success story for our region. It also kept Naval Air Station Oceania here, which is kind of a big deal, I think, for us. Huge. Huge. So, um, so we've had some experience with that. We've been through this process. There have been other studies uh, that have happened up on the peninsula, uh, one for uh, Langley Air Force Base um, that happened about 10 years ago. Um, since then, uh, we've um, been continuing to work with the military, um, and in this case, I think our experience with and understanding of the current impacts of flooding and also what the future impacts of sea level rise are, we had a much greater appreciation of, of the need to, to look at how that would affect our military installations and what could be done about it. And so uh, we put in, so this is so just a little bit more background on, on the issue. We work a lot on sea level rise here at the PDC. I know this group has had a lot more focus on transportation in the past. Um, but this is one of the maps that we use, one of our regional sea level rise planning scenarios uh, that was adopted by the commission about a year and a half or so ago. Um, this is just three feet, and those areas in blue are the ones that would be inundated at high water, high tide, and uh, the green areas are those that would be subject to ponding. So the point of this map and the other ones that we show for this sort of thing is this, just to say that we understand that there are significant impacts coming to us from sea level rise, and we need to actually do something to plan for those impacts. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What is ponding? Ponding, so it's, a, it's an area uh, it's getting a little bit of the weeds in the GIS analysis here. Um, That's okay, but they are, you said that one. Sure. Uh, so the green areas are those that um, uh, are below the, the projected elevation of the water at that point, but are not, uh, you could not tell if they were connected. So what we're saying is that groundwater could rise, or you could have rainfall that wouldn't have anywhere to go. Um, and so the water got there would have to be stayed there. Now, this is, that's just the, the, it's an artifact of the analysis to some degree. We know that we need to do um, the better work when it comes to actually modeling this kind of stuff. But that's where that term comes from. Okay. Sure. Um, so when it comes to looking at the impacts of uh, sea level rise and flooding on the military, um, we are not the first people to identify this challenge. Um, in fact, this has actually been uh, a subject of uh, statewide and national press for several years now. Um, we had a visit from several members of Congress last summer. And we're trying to look at this issue. The, I think it's the Select Committee or the Speaker Select Committee on the Climate Crisis was established after uh, the Democrats took over the House. 
2018. So they reestablished that committee, and the chairman or chairwoman of that committee and several other members um, came and visited Naval Station Norfolk. They came and we had a meeting here uh, to talk with them about what was going on. So we know that this is happening, but also the press is out there. They're, they're driving up the story that our major naval installations are, are vulnerable to sea level rise. And things need to be done about it. I think the good news is that, that we are trying. We know this is an issue and that we're working on it. So I think um, in trying to frame this issue, and, and you know, we have these military installations here. They're right next door to us. We have communities that are right across the you know, defense line. And sometimes we don't always talk to each other enough. Uh, we don't always, uh, we're not coming from the same point of view, the same frame of reference. Um, we looked at those challenges in terms of understanding and you know, lack of information, different values and different priorities, and thought that those might be, we could look at those and reframe them as, as opportunities for how we might come together to identify uh, potential steps or recommendations uh, that would be mutually beneficial. That's the goal here with these studies. It's not, you know, what can the military do for us or what can we do for the military, it's what can we do together to, to advance both of our needs and our wants at the same time. And so, for us, the Joint Land Use Study, it builds on, on what we've already done in our region. It also takes advantage of all the work that, in this case, the cities of Norfolk and Virginia Beach have done and are doing to address sea level rise and flooding. It really does, it provides us with a, an official way of engaging the Navy uh, at a level of conversation that is otherwise somewhat difficult to do. There are a lot of operational issues. Um, with talking with the Navy, with getting them on the record and saying certain things about you know, what's affecting them. So this process is, is a DOD process. It's managed by uh, the Office of Economic Adjustment. That's part of the Department of Defense. So they know this process. They're comfortable with it. They're experienced with it. And as a result, we can use that to kind of drive this conversation forward. And hopefully it will, um, at the end of the day, it will set us up to get additional assistance from the state if they come up with resources of funding or from the federal government for funding for, for local projects that would actually have a direct benefit for the military. So in terms of the timeline, um, this, this process, so it's been somewhat, the, the new, the current program has been kind of tweaked, but for us, we're under the old program. Uh, in 2015, uh, folks from Commander Navy Region Mid-Atlantic submitted a nomination on behalf of the four installations that I'm going to be talking about uh, to the Department of Defense Office of Economic Adjustment. They nominate and then OEA comes down, they talk to us, they meet with stakeholders, and then they invite us to submit an application. So it's not competitive. Once we were invited, as long as we actually did, the, did a good enough application, we were going to be getting some funding. So that's a nice thing to have, is we can just stand here, write this up, and we'll give you money as long as you dot your I's across your T's. Um, in 2016, we released, uh, we submitted the application, and then later that year, released the RFP for it. 2017, we um, issued a contract between us and AECOM, our, our selected firm, and their team, and started holding committee meetings. We had our first public meeting in 2018. The draft study, this is a, not the full timeline, just an abbreviated version, was released, I think, in May 2019, sometime around then. Uh, the final uh, was sent out, I mean, later that summer, or later, later that spring, and then our final, the, uh, we had the final study was completed in August of 2019. This is our group that was involved in this. So we were the administrator. This is actually, so it's not a regional plan that we're doing here. This is not a, a PDC plan. This is a plan that we were, or a project to be managed on behalf as the sponsor, but really on behalf of the two cities. So this is a, this is a, a study, a plan that is really meant to guide what the cities of Norfolk and Virginia Beach can do going forward. We work with four different installations on the south side, Joint Expeditionary Base, Little Creek, Fort Story, Naval Station, Norfolk. Naval Support Activity Hampton Roads and uh, Naval Air Station Oceana, including uh, several of the sub facilities. The auxiliary facilities are located outside the main fence line. And then our team included AE Combus, the Prime, and then Moffat and Nickel, the model agency, and the <coughs> consulting as the sub consultants for different specific parts of the project. It's just a geographic area of, the, uh, of interest that we looked at throughout this project. So we weren't just looking at the areas that were right next to the bases. We were also looking at where people might be coming from throughout these two communities. We understand that people that work at the Navy installations, they live throughout Hampton Roads. We did have to kind of focus in with these two cities because they were the ones that were actually working on it. Uh, but we did look at some of the regional impacts in terms of transportation, particularly how do people get to work? That was a big part of the study. And knowing, and I wanted to understand how that would, how flooding would impact the ability of people to access these spaces. 
So we, in terms of structure, we had a policy committee that had elected officials and the city managers for both cities and also representatives from the Navy. Uh, we had a federal committee that had a range of staff representatives from both cities and also um, uh, Navy folks from each of the installations in addition to regional representatives. Just uh, uh, our process here, uh, went through a full uh, range of prepar preparations beginning to figure out exactly what we were going to address. Moved on into the information gathering. We had a very robust uh, stakeholder interview process where we interviewed, I think, about 80, 70 to 80, 80 different uh, groups or individuals at the beginning of this process that was beyond the public meetings that we drew for this meeting or for the study uh, to get it, uh, to make sure that um, what we were proposing to study was actually some like things that were, were would, that our public, our, our representatives, our stakeholders would actually validate, and they did. Uh, we identified a number of issues to focus on. Unfortunately, we couldn't actually address all of those, um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit here in a bit about um, how we were able to address, in a limited fashion, those issues that came up that were outside the scope of the study. Moved on into analysis and then the development of recommendations and strategies, and then we finished the, um, the study, uh, late, like I said, late last year. So in terms of questions, you know, we went into this, we knew that we had already had that experience with the airfields. Both cities had no desire to, to readdress those issues. They, you know, both, I, they, you know, cities, in terms of Virginia Beach and Chesapeake, have both adopted very robust uh, ordinances and policies to address the encroachment. So there was no desire to, to go and kind of uh, reinvent the wheel of that. We wanted, really wanted to focus on, on the impacts of flooding. And so at the beginning, we had to figure out you know, when we talk about flooding, what are, we, what are we talking about? Which aspect of flooding are we trying to address? Are we trying to address hurricanes? Are we trying to address uh, daily flooding? Are we trying to address the 1% uh, the annual storm surge event? What that, what your decision there, it really does drive what you're able to do from a, an analytical perspective, and also it will drive what your policy recommendations that come out of that process will be. We need to figure out where we were gonna focus our attention in terms of geography, um, get a sense of, of what is important to the Navy. Even through this process, they can't just tell us, you know, build that road. Uh, they do have certain uh, uh, requirements or limitations that are placed on them by, by Congress in terms of what they're allowed to do as a federal agency, in terms of uh, dictating the local governments. The spirit of federalism lives on in that regard. Um, but we can, uh, if we understand what their needs are and what they, what they prioritize in terms of uh, services, you know, then we can use those to develop a way of kind of assessing our own recommended projects or a list of potential projects and score those in a way. So it kind of gets at what they want, specifically by getting a better understanding of what they want in a general sense. And then we can use that information to prioritize local projects that may already be on the books, but we can look at them through that lens of what's best for the military. So when it comes to flooding, we focused on uh, what we call minor tidal flooding. This is that it's supposed to be a uh, representative representation of that kind of, not maybe not daily, but certainly frequent flooding that might be having an impact on your ability to get to and from work or your ability to access different services or infrastructure um, or facilities throughout your community. We looked at um, minor tidal flooding in current, so with no sea level rise, and then we added one and a half and three feet of sea level rise to that, uh, that scenario to get a sense of how that might change um, in the future with sea level rise. Uh, once we had a sense of which areas were flooded, we looked at the impacts of transportation and how uh, which corridors or stretches or segments of roadway would be flooded under each of those scenarios. And then we were able to use that to get a sense of how access to different things would actually be affected by that flooding. And so this, these, the color you can kind of see um, up here, over here, it doesn't really look like a lot, right? So that you see the, the direct areas um, of, of the roads that are actually going to be flooded. But then you look and you can see here much more clearly, I think, the impacts of those roadways uh, flooding would actually have. And so those red areas here are completely blocked from <coughs> accessing one or more uh, community assets that we identified as being of importance to the Navy. So things like fire stations, um, hospitals, schools, shelters, electrical substations, treatment plants for water and wastewater. Um, so, so this right here, I think, is a, is a, is a good representation of, of what those impacts to the, um, to just access, to actually be able to get two things will look like as a result of sea level rise. And then we were able to use that to kind of focus in and identify some priority areas. Uh, we originally started, had, had seven. We ended up going down to four because we only had a, you know, a few years to actually work on it and wanted to really focus in be able to, to give the right total attention to these areas. And we use these areas to, to, 
kind of zone in and, and focus in on the, the types of projects or the list of projects that localities had already developed uh, to, to address flooding. So we're fortunate in this case that Norfolk and Virginia Beach had already developed very comprehensive capital improvement programs to address flooding. Um, so we were able to kind of take the projects that were located in or near these areas and then use those uh, and then focus in on those and figure out which ones of those might actually benefit the military area. So what we did uh, with this uh, was we, so on the left here you can see these are some of the values, the things that the Navy really told us were important to them. So getting <coughs> to and from the installations, dealing with water on the roadways and on like, on property, dealing with storm water well, and then having what they call, what we call a reliable and resilient utility network. So wastewater, drinking water, power, those kind of things. These are the things that the Navy needs to, to operate. We were able to turn those into criteria such as uh, uh, these four different categories here, installation readiness, and personnel readiness, community co-benefits, and system performance, so that we can actually assign a kind of a yes or no or a point value to each of those candidate projects. Candidate's kind of a strong word for that. But each of the proposed projects that were lumped into this that the city's asked us to score, um, we were able to score each of those to develop a, a list of, of actual, of our prioritized <coughs> list of potential projects in the context of the study. So at the end of the day, we came up with uh, 22 actions. These are projects or project-related actions. Um, so things like uh, if, if we have a flooding uh, issue at one place, right? If we don't have a solution identified, then the action there is coming up with that solution. Um, but it's more specific than some of these other policy changes or recommendations that we included in the what we we'll call it regional coordination strategies. And then I mentioned earlier that uh, we, you know, we had our stakeholder engagement process. Um, that there were a number of um, things that came up that we couldn't study. We included those in the appendix as part of these conversations, right? We know, we didn't want to, I think, um, you know, cordon off and, and not say to the Navy, well, we can't talk about that right now. We, we, we were talking to them about what their issues were. We wanted to hear all of their issues so that we can help inform other processes that are going on. So you may be familiar with some of the issues regarding the proposed expansion of the Norfolk Airport. Um, that came up. Uh, there are other issues that, um, like similar to that, that the, the Navy identified as concerns. So we're able to take the, the those interviews that we have and use that information and relay that to other stakeholders or through other processes. Uh, and so, again, we wanted to document it, uh, but we didn't use those conversations as a ways to our as part of our identifying what the specific actions would be. This is the list of the top eight. Of those projects, it was 22. So the top two here are what we're calling comprehensive flood mitigation and stormwater management strategies. It's a really long way of saying that we need to figure out what we're going to do on Hampton Boulevard and Shore Drive. Um, and that could be, will be, frankly, some combination of hard infrastructure, right, land use change, and um, community asset movement or uh, adaptation. So, you know, we think uh, commonly, you know, we're just to raise the road. Well, especially in places like uh, Hampton Boulevard particularly, but also Shore Drive. Uh, raising the road is only part of the solution, right? So you'll also have to deal with all the different utilities, all the different electrical work that's going on there. You might have impacts on the neighboring private property. You have to figure out some way to do about that. You have to worry about tie-ins of uh, other roads coming into those corridors. So we recognize that these were really complicated things. We don't actually have solutions for those yet, although both cities have identified parts of what those solutions might look like. But we think a more comprehensive study uh, would be helpful to figuring out what the big plan for each of those would be. And then we've got a number of other projects here uh, that were listed as high. Uh, yes, yes sir. Sorry. Sorry. So were, were, were these actions identified and discovered as a result of the study, or did the study confirm that these actions are? It's a mix of both. So some of these, um, so for example, there are two here on number five and number eight there that were identified in the Norfolk Coastal Storm Risk Management Study with the core. Uh, we looked at those in the context of whether or not these uh, rec those recommendations might have a benefit to the Navy, and, that's, and they do, so that's why they were included. Um, those two uh, comprehensive strategies, I think they, they started out as much smaller in scope, um, things like raising roads, and then when we got to the you know, part where we were looking at one and a half degrees of sea level rise, I think we, we, the team agreed that looking at those in a bigger fashion would be more appropriate. So, so it's more than what the cities had in mind when they initially did it. Before you move off of that, how, how is this study and this analysis tied in with the individual cities and their various capital improvement projects 
city of Virginia Beach is dedicating millions of dollars right now to Shore Drive on both sides of the Western Bridge. Do, do they talk to this and this talk to that? Absolutely, yeah. So we, um, you know, unfortunately, we the timing didn't work out to make everything dovetail perfectly. But we had uh, uh, engagement, direct engagement from public works officials on both sides uh, of the, uh, the jurisdictional line. In that particular case, I think, um, and you know, and I'll, my closing slide here, you know, it talks about next steps. Um, we have now this justification in the study that we need to look at Shore Drive, for example. Having that in the study will, will line the city up for potential funding from a number of different federal programs to, to, to do some of the work that's been identified from a planning and design perspective. Um, so specifically, there, you know, they, I think the city has had done a lot of work on the Shore Drive, um, Eastern Shore Drive area um, when it comes to stormwater management, I believe as a result of the ongoing work the city's doing right now, that that work may be, that scope may be changing a little bit. There might be some need to do some additional design work, some en engineering work, and this will talk a little tie into that. So that's another, I guess, a benefit of kind of leaving it in this some more hazy terminology here, is that we know that, we knew that the city was doing that work. We knew that we should include that. If we didn't include it, it would be a gaping hole in this study if we didn't identify that as a, as a recommendation. Um, but we didn't want to pretend, I guess, that we had the solution in mind that the city was already doing a lot of work on it. I mean, so this was identified two or three years ago as a candidate, um, and then the city obviously, especially in Virginia Beach, has done quite a lot of work over the last two years in terms of identifying specific projects. Uh, so, so I guess to answer your question, yes, there was a lot of, of coordination as much as we possibly could do, but we knew that the cities would be going off and doing their own work at the same time. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, I, so Tom Tom Lady was, was the prime person on our committee uh, before he was, he was bumped up uh, to, to acting city manager. Uh, we also had um, uh, Tony Alger and uh, CJ Barr and some other folks from from the city. A lot of a lot of engagement from from the folks that are working on the Dewberry study and the other civilized work right now. From and Ben, just want to add to that thing. During the data gathering, uh, you recall that uh, ACOM, they looked at all those plans and uh, that the cities were doing, as well as the, the Navy, too. So there was a lot of data gathering. And having that technical committee also is import, an important uh, avenue to get that information in real time. Thanks, So uh, one of the um, interesting things that we threw in this project um, that we were lucky enough, we have built it in as a kind of an optional thing to do, and we ended up having enough time was to look at some what we call model projects. We had, uh, we had asked AECOM to have on hand some design professionals. Um, so this is mostly a planning study, but we wanted to have the input from some engineers and some landscape architects. And we asked the cities kind of which areas would they be willing to look at um, some innovative, potentially innovative solutions. And in this case, this right here was one, where we looked at the, uh, the area of Hampton Boulevard, the stretch from the uh, Lafayette River Bridge, um, north to uh, NIT, and so you can see there on the left, this, the, all these, these green dots here are observed flooding cases that the city reported. Um, and then on the right here is just a schematic showing a potential realignment of roads and stormwater infrastructure that would require uh, coordination and partnership between the Navy, the port, and the city to potentially result in a much more comprehensive and better stormwater management solution in that area than what each of those three could do on the own. So this is a case of where, where the sum is, or the I guess the output is greater than the sum of the parts if you just look at the individual work that each component, each entity there could work on on its own. So we think that this sort of approach is something that, that in this case specifically that we should continue to look at. I understand the port is, is interested in, in this kind of thing and the Navy is also going to be doing some redevelopment there anyway. Um, so we think it's, it's an opportunity for, for those, those entities to partner with each other, to, to coordinate, and to potentially have a solution there that can really help address some flooding in that area of Hampton Boulevard. Ben, yes, ma'am. quick question. <coughs> Given that the Navy is part of the solution and that the Navy can be called on to do other things at any given time, um, how does that filter into how these projects could be done or postponed? <coughs> So um, most of these projects, so this, this particular one here is one that would require some sort of coordination because it would involve Navy property 
and some sort of contribution and it may be funded. Uh, the vast majority of the projects that we identified are local projects only. Um, and in fact, actually, that's really like the, the, so the joint land use study process is intended to develop recommendations for the localities in the state, not for the military. In this case, this is a collaborative uh, concept here that, you know, there are some opportunities now where the, where the Navy and the military in general are starting to look at how do we share costs, how do we reach across the fence. So obviously your, your point about, you know, the, the, I guess the military being distracted right, or having other priorities at different times is certainly uh, something that could impede something like this. But they, they do have to pay for their stormwater <coughs> maintenance at some point. They do have funding streams for uh, uh, military construction and things like that that are ongoing. Uh, so we understand their priorities may change, but <coughs> another part of the study was identifying those lines of communication between the people that are helping to manage the installations and at the city side, the department level, so they can continue these, off, these, these conversations. <coughs> We're not talking with the sailors that are going off on those ships. We have the planners and the engineers and the folks that make sure that Norfolk Naval Base kind of keeps ticking. Yeah. Okay, thank so, you. sure. <coughs> in terms of uh, the last round of, of public um, engagement, we had two meetings in August, one in Norfolk at the TED, one in Virginia Beach at the Sandler Center. We had pretty decent attendance of those. We received a total of six public comments that were submitted. Uh, nothing that was really criticizing the study, more just like things like really liked it with the flooding or green infrastructure. Um, and, or the, and then we had some questions at the meetings that we just answered um, at, during the presentation. Had a couple um, minor tweaks in terms of uh, the document. So at, at the end, we had a, a technical correction from the City of Norfolk uh, flood management staff that we fixed that uh, with a description of their flood management <coughs> ordinance. And then also we added and beefed up the discussion about the airport. Obviously, this is an issue of, of, of uh, great attention at that point when we were finishing up the study when it kind of bubbled up to the surface again. So wanted to make sure that we, what we said in there um, supported the efforts by both the, the city and the, the military to kind of work towards a solution that worked for everybody. Um, so we don't have a specific recommendation for what they should do about the airport. We just think that they should talk about it some more. <laughs> They definitely do. <laughs> and so uh, moving forward, we have a couple of just specific next steps for that study. Uh, we anticipate that both cities or uh, councils are going to consider resolutions of support for the study uh, this month, if not this month and next month, I think. And then uh, we are working with both cities and with OEA on the development of implementation grants. So one of the nice things about this study is that it does give us, um, you know, it opens us up to the possibility of receiving additional funding from OEA to move forward on some of those recommendations. And so we're working with the cities to figure out which projects they might want to move forward on. Um, as I said here, there's only, it's a 10% non-federal match, which is a really good deal. You know, working in the grant world with federal folks, usually you're looking at 50-50 for a lot of projects. In this case, we only have to pay 10% of the total project budget. The OEA picks up 90%. Um, they can fund up to 30% of design. Uh, that's it, and the, so no construction. So they can help us plan, they can help us design, but they can't help us build, but they can put us in a better place uh, to build on our own or to build other sources of funding, whether they're federal or state. I think that's everything I have. Um, be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay. And, uh, yeah, we're gonna go around, so after you've asked your question, make sure that other people get a chance to do Okay. Um, Couple of questions. I'll try and be very quick. Who's the OEA? The Office of Economic Adjustment. Okay. And then um, in the study that you guys are doing and the research that you're putting together, how much of that are you addressing with either A, over de development in those areas without the proper drainage? Maybe there's antiquated pipes or dredging that has not been maintained properly that would cause some of this flooding. It's not necessarily, you know, sea level rising, although that may be the issue as well. But, you know, what we've discovered in Virginia Beach is a lot of overdevelopment without the proper um, piping put in or proper dredging of areas, ditching, that kind of stuff. So how much of that is in your study? So we did not get to that level of analysis when we were potential flooding scenarios. Uh, we just we didn't have the capacity to be engineering. Uh, so that may uh, still be part of the issue is that yeah. there's some antiquated sure. localities. That's the kind of work that um, you know that the cities are doing on their own that we moving forward we can absorb that that work and look at it again in the context of what we've done with the military, how that would 
effect, those kind of maps show the flooding area. Right. We didn't actually get to that level of analysis. We didn't. I mean, the, the work that Virginia Beach is doing right now is something that they would not, would not probably not, this is just my, my professional opinion, would not have been able to do when we were first starting this. They were not at that level yet. Mm -hmm. They had not done some of the prep work. And so now they are there, and it would have been, I think, it would have been great to have that work when we first started this process, but unfortunately that, that didn't happen. It doesn't always work right. out that way. Right, right, right. I just, yeah, so. I'm, my recommendation sure. for what it's worth is that that certainly is included in any of the studies because, you know, there are things get old and break down and if we're not maintaining um, our own dredging levels and certainly our own pipelines that can become antiquated then that causes a lot of the flooding as well sure. and certainly new development on top of antiquated you know pipelines and city you know facilities in that nature would certainly cause a backup as well well I'm, I'm the projects that we did look in this were those that were submitted by the city. So okay. I would think that at least in some way there would be some indirect consideration right. of those issues. Yes. If the city has already identified that as kind of challenge or issue in a certain place and developed a project, we would look at that project in terms of its benefits to the military. Okay. Um, but we weren't getting down to, the, to which pipes are too well, small. Well, okay. Not, Not too, too small. Yeah. 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 Anybody else on this side have anything? No, Mark, go ahead. So, <clears throat> There is, there is incidental damage from much lower levels of sea level rise than <coughs> even a foot. For example, our ordinary vehicles are not designed to drive through salt or brackish water. Um, if you look at those sorts of ramifications, so we did, um, so we have the two sea level rise scenarios, but we also looked at existing minor tidal flooding, um, but we didn't look at, uh, I guess, so that would be one scenario where we would look at how things are in the current day under, I think it, a minor tidal flooding is roughly a 10% annual, or yeah, 10% annual chance event. Um, so yes, we did look at that to some extent. Anybody along here? I didn't see. Sorry, Robert. But, you know, when these bases operate, you know, first of all, was this a ditch study which focused only on flooding because when these bases operate, there's a lot more stuff going on there. Uh, transportation, and traffic, and pollution sources, uh, industrial processes, et cetera, et cetera. You know, which, which, which affect the basis operations internally as well as the community as well. So, are any of those, in a study like this, are any of those attributes looked at uh, in, in, in terms of potential burdens that these uh, uh, bases create on communities and also how those potential attributes are controlled within the confines of the modular bases? So, we, uh, we're, we were restricted from doing much work within the fence line. Mm -hmm. uh, the authorization for this program only allows us to look at impacts that are happening outside of the fence. Uh, we did have discussions with the Navy, and certainly we want to promote some ongoing discussions between the cities and the Navy to address those issues when they could have right. impacts across the fence line. Um, we didn't look at specific actions taking place on base. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. We'll see it. Uh, just real quick, Ben, uh, moving forward, Part of your next steps. Uh, any, I know we're looking at the federal piece, but the state piece, given uh, Ann Phillips' uh, new position at all, is there any opportunities for state to chip in in terms of grants or uh, uh, flooding protection, those kinds of things, or is it all federal? So at the moment, there's um, there is no dedicated state funding for this sort of kind of flood mitigation mm -hmm. construction. There are some dam. There's a source of funding called the Dam safety, flood protection, I'm going to get that term wrong, um, but it's, uh, there's a, a limited source of funding for dam safety and kind of engineering work, and also some floodplain protection and planning programs, and we've gotten some grants to do so. Flood insurance outreach, you may have seen on the yeah. website we put together on Get Flood Fluent, um, that goes to that funds, that sort of work, it doesn't fund construction. There, I believe there are some discussions happening with the Secretary of Natural Resources Office about 
putting together a source of funding at the state level uh, that would actually pay for construction, but I don't know how far along those discussions have gone. We are working with Ann Phillips, the special assistant to the governor. Yeah. Um, but that's and, and that's that's both kind of in line with this, and Ann came down to several of our meetings, mm -hmm. and she's um, and participating in the, the study work we're doing with the Chesapeake or also. Um, but we also work with Ann and our other kind of silos here as well when it comes to resiliency and, and COVID management. So, so we are trying to kind of make sure all the dots are connected when they need to be. I'm going to get the rest of them. Many years, like George. Yeah, I got a couple. Uh, Substance is is huge here. Uh, have you been working with Vims at all? Yes. Okay. Uh, basically, two thirds, half to two thirds of the sea level rise is, is kind of hidden under relative sea level rise because it's actually subsidence, not sea level rise. The most extreme, <coughs> most of the most extreme estimates of sea level rise come from the IPCC. And in their first assessment in 1990, and the resources here, their estimate was from 30 inches to 100 inches, which was 11.8 inches to 39.4 inches by 2100. By 2001, the IPC's third assessment, it went from 9 millimeters to 88 millimeters, which is 3.5 inches to 34.6 inches. Or I mean, so I'm validating where you're, let's, let's, let's look at three, three feet go. However, by the fourth assessment, it was down to 18 centimeters to 59 centimeters, which brings it down from 7.1 inches to 23.2 inches. So now you're under two feet. So I'm thinking that your three-foot assessment is even out of the realm of the IPC worst-case estimates. And the fourth assessment was several years ago. We're due for the fifth assessment coming out fairly soon. That being said, adding a foot 18 inches to the base flood elevation for all these projects still makes perfect sense based on subsidence and sea level rise combined at, at any of those estimates. So that's, you know, rising, it's expensive. Uh, it does develop other areas. You're gonna have to have conduits for drainage to get out underneath these roads. So you're not trapping and causing all kinds of uh, residential and neighborhood flooding problems, and I'm sure your project is looking at that. The over -de development exacerbates subsidence, as does groundwater withdrawal. Was that looked at at all? <coughs> some, some of the things we're talking about, building codes, some of these things we're talking about, you know, uh, permit restrictions. Have you visited that at all? So the observed subsidence in the region was factored into those relative sea level rise scenarios. Yeah, relative sea level rise includes subsidence. Yeah, so when, we, when we're talking about one and a half and three feet, that includes all of the different components that are driving sea level change. Um, but we did not actually look at uh, the specifics of a, a given certain specific area in terms of measuring or, or a subsidence rate. Okay. So we do have a number of other studies and work that's going on uh, working with the United States Geological Survey, they're using benchmarking work that's trying to get a better understanding of how subsidence trends vary across the region. Um, that's still, uh, it's, we've been working on that for a few years now, um, but it's, it's at this point, it's, it's still, the data is still kind of outweighed by the noise, um, but we will have a better understanding of how that varies. Um, so, I think, did that understand it? Yeah. That's your question. I mean, we're looking at it and not in the context, it was kind of, it's, that's again, it's, I think too, almost too much in the weeds for this, this study, which was looking at uh, projects that had already been proposed by the cities for their own work to figure out which of those might benefit the military. Um, but we are looking at that issue uh, on its own. Thank you. Thank you. Keith? Yeah, just to add on a little bit to Delstino's question, uh, which is a good one, because these are very, very expensive projects um, about state funding. There is a precedent for state funding um, but not for this kind of encroachment. Uh, both Virginia Beach and Hampton benefited from matching state funds to help address the encroachment there. So hopefully we can tap into something like that. Yeah, that, that funding was for land acquisition and for property rights acquisition in the, in for the crash zones and, and other noise zones around those two airfields. Okay, I have one question, Andrew. They're in the room. Um, our role in this what do you want to hear from us? <laughs> if you have um, any comments, I mean, to be honest, the, the North Virginia Beach study has been submitted to OEA already, I think, going forward. Um, we, so 
we honestly haven't had a discussion internally about how to engage uh, this group, and, and I don't even think, at this point, we're not planning to have the commission, my understanding, Bob's here, so Bob, please correct me if I'm wrong on this. Um, we're not, the, the plan is just not to actually have the commission approve this, since it's a local study, we're just administering the grant, we're managing the grant, the contract with AECOM, but we're not actually, it's not our plan, it's the locality's plan. So I think, you know, if you all have uh, comments or suggestions, I think, um, you know, we are still, we have another study that's going on with sports with the Chesapeake that we're using the same model for. Um, and so, you know, those, and all our meetings are open to the public um, for our committees and, and in addition to those public meetings as well. So, you know, I'm happy to take comments or questions, but um, I don't know if we have several for this group. Now, let me say, so first of all, I think that we should provide the CAC with link to what's been done so far. Links, copies of the report, and then the links to send to them. And so they can use it so they have to do it. Then add the CAC as a check mark and see that you can follow up and do on that to your activities so that you can go on it. Mostly, if you're interested in the greater public knowing about these different areas, this is your course. So you give them this information and, and then they can give it to their people. That's why they're here. Probably going to send it out in their just that. Okay? So if you could provide them with more information after the movie, we appreciate it. Yeah, all the, so the studies and, and other information for both the <coughs> and also for the tools of one are on our website right now. Thanks, Ben. Um, there's a link. I think it's on the homepage. There's one of the rotating things on the HRPDC homepage. <coughs> if you could send, send that directly out. to Kendall, she'll get it all, get it out to us, and then we can respond to that. And we are ready to go to the next thing. And thank you very much. It was enlightening. <laughs> <laughs> And you're up next. Yes, and if I could say, first off, Ben, thank you for your work on this effort. But CINO had an important role as well from a public engagement standpoint. I just follow up on the conversation as well. So Ben showed you, and of course this study started three years ago, before we expanded the duties of this yeah. CAC. But I think what Ben's giving you is sort of a foundation now that maybe you can start thinking about their next study, which is that Chesapeake Portsmouth. Yeah, I've been. You know the community. So when you start thinking about the issues that impact their military bases, that would be helpful input uh, to, to, um, to understand. And you know, you could send it to me or, or Ben, and you know, that can help inform that study. So yeah. that would be helpful. That includes, one of the things we looked at when was at one of these meetings was how you get to work. And that means that other cities where people come to Portsmouth to work at the Naval Shipyard, for instance, if there is some flooding in your neighborhood or someplace and you can't get to work, that is part of this whole thing. It is a, an issue. So well, one of the things that I learned, Ben, maybe talking about down by Bandac, there was an area that um, when it floods quite frequently, and people in Virginia Beach know this, I know, um, the neighborhood has to cut through the base to get home. <laughs> and, and you know when you're when you're operating a military base, obviously that's a that's a challenging situation. If, if I may, Madam Chair, just conclude by saying the value of what's been presented today is this is really the first time that the military bases and the localities have come together and sort of all hands in and say, look, we don't know all the solutions, but here are our problems mm -hmm. and. You know, Ben showed you the top tier of those. You know, there were many of them, but now at least we have a top eight to start dealing with so that we can go talk to the federal government now. You have the military talking consistently with the community and the community stakeholders that they're engaged. And now our federal representatives, I think, are starting to get their attention that maybe, you know, there's a consensus for how we might proceed. So. Okay. Well, Thank you. I'm sorry, real quick. We're talking about the military bases kind of being walled off from the communities. How about we, and maybe one of the reasons that we're all sitting around this table, we need the communities talking to each other because flooding certainly doesn't respect corporate, <coughs> municipal, city boundaries. And that's part of what's going on with this is I, I know that they're going to these communities and then the people who are working for the cities 
who are getting this information shared. It is and it is. I mean, Indian River Road it, cuts from it, Virginia it, Beach and Chesapeake, and then then this Stop is where, the city line is a very easy. Yes, and this is where we come in solution. to go to the PDC and say, you guys need to pay more attention to this, and it needs to be more regional and not just two cities at a time or, or whatever. So I, I agree with you there, and that is our role. So good point, comparison. Very good point. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Madam Chair, if I may, um, we, we do have a resiliency program here at PDC, and we have a committee, a coastal resiliency committee, mm -hmm. with local staff representatives that meet monthly, once a quarter. Uh, to talk about these issues. So we are looking at them on a regional basis. A lot of the projects are that have been identified and proposed and different planning activities have been done. And are, but those are very much like site, scale, local projects. Um, the ones that are, are that are multiple jurisdictions are still very much in the conceptual phase and there's no consensus yet on what those projects might be or what they might look like. But those conversations are happening. <coughs> and we'd like to be part of that conversation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, well thanks. Um, first, uh, Bob Crum um, with the Planning District Commission and Transportation Planning Board. So you're not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you actually have a name. <laughs> but um, I think I've met just about everybody here, but for those that I haven't, I certainly look forward to continuing to work with you. So I'd like to um, share some information with you on two projects and, and get your discussion and input. Um, the first being our regional broadband strategy or initiative um, for the Hampton Roads region. Um, everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. um, so this story really starts with some interesting um, opportunities that have really landed here in Hampton Roads and Virginia Beach. Um, we have transatlantic broadband cables. Um, uh, the first two, uh, one came from uh, Bilbao, Spain, the other came from South America, and they both landed in Virginia Beach, came ashore in Virginia Beach. Um, in addition to that, we have two more that have been finalized for approval and construction, and we're in the running for as many as six to eight more of these tables to come across the Atlantic Ocean and land in Virginia Beach. Now, I'll start this presentation by saying I'm a community planner, right? I'm not a technical guy, right? So I, when this was first brought to me, I said, okay. <laughs> and we have broadband now, help, help me understand what, what's happening. The first cable alone, the first cable alone um, tripled the amount of capacity coming over the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. Um, that started to get my attention. Now, when, so my next question was, well, how many cables do we have coming over the Atlantic Ocean? So I can understand in terms of context. So these are all the existing cables that come across the ocean. And what you'll see is that most of them land up here in the Northeast, <laughs> and most of them land down here in the Florida area. But when you look from Jacksonville the whole way up to that New York area, here we are in Virginia Beach, uh, in the Mid-Atlantic region. We're the only area where these cables are coming ashore. Now, the, the cables, uh, two of those cables have landed already. Uh, there was a conference that happened about two to three weeks ago up in Washington, D.C. There's been a lot of conversation, okay, these cables are here now, are they as powerful as what they were saying, right? So they made this announcement at the conference at the first cable alone that they put this into context. Um, it is so powerful that you could take every movie every ma ever made in every language that exists in the world and send all those movies across the Atlantic Ocean in 58 seconds. Wow. Okay, so at the planner meeting said, okay, now I'm starting to get it. <laughs> um, powerful, fast speeds. And, and the technical people can argue how fast and what the latency is, et cetera, but <clears throat> an incredible opportunity for Hampton Reds. These cables have landed down in Virginia Beach, uh, down by that Camp Pendleton area. Uh, this is the cable landing site. Uh, so the question has become, how do we utilize and leverage these ultra-fast cables as an economic development opportunity and driver for the Hampton Reds region? 
So what we've been engaged with is an effort working with all of our localities over the probably the past two years, it started a conversation, it's really heated up over the last 12 to 18 months, about how we offload this ultra-fast service. I can tell you that Ashburn and all these other places, they're racing to get down. And Rico County's already come down, they tied into these cables, and they're going to service White right Oak Park up by Richmond International Airport uh, with, with this service, right? And everybody else is coming here to, to get at this ultra-fast uh, speed in these ultra fast networks. So our officials said, how do we off ramp some of this ultra fast service into Hampton Roads? And how do we off that ramp that in a way that's not all pass through, that we can provide some of this ultra fast fast service here in, in the Hampton Roads region? So what's come up is this notion of a phased approach um, to a regional fiber network. Uh, Virginia Beach has worked with the private sector to create basically a carrier neutral hotel in Virginia Beach where these subsea cables connect into. And from there, everybody can connect in and purchase service from these subsea cables. The plan that's come up is to create um, an interconnected fiber system. Phase one would connect to these cables and create a ring on the south side. Uh, that ring uh, would interconnect the cities of Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Portsmouth, Chesapeake, and Suffolk. Uh, it would um, interconnect growth areas, employment centers. Um, it would create uh, interconnect um, areas for business development, areas of higher education, uh, providing this ultra-fast service. Now, one thing I want to stress, um, the proposal here is not for public government to get <coughs> service business. This is a middle mile dark fiber system. The public sector would build the ring um, and then they would come up with arrangements for the private sector to ride the ring. Um, we've had meetings, we had a meeting two weeks ago with Cox Communication, we have another meeting with Cox Communication tomorrow. We want the existing provider, we want all the other providers to ride this ultra fast network and then what they will do is we're building the information highway, we want them to ride it, and then they provide the last mile services, the homes and businesses, and we want them to be very, very economically successful. So this is about a win-win for, for our community, it's about a win-win for the uh, existing private providers, and most importantly, it's about how we create economic growth and jobs in, in our community. I have a, uh, go ahead, Madam Chair, I don't know if you want me to do you questions. Can, you can just, go ahead. just a quick question. You're talking about talks about the riding the, the network. What will they pay to ride the network? So so what uh, what I'll show you what I'll show you is the governance structure and that answer is yet to be determined and that will be part of my presentation. So okay. When you said pass through, I don't understand. If we didn't do this, the cable would just it's not going to dead end where it's you know, no, but what would happen if we didn't do this? Okay, so if we would so what we mean by pass through is Ashburn's come down and they've connected and they're sending this fast service to Northern Virginia. How are they connecting to it? Uh, they they're riding down and people are lying, laying fiber. They are. And coming down the private sector they're connecting to it. Richmond's already done that. And so Cox Cable and them can't connect to them in the Richmond. They, like they they can. They can, but what we're doing is giving them the option of, of riding our, um, our system. And if I can go a little further, these are great questions. They're the right questions, and you can sort of see the, the strategy and system that we're setting up. Now, the first phase is a ring on the south side. The second phase is a similar ring on the peninsula that would interconnect across our bridge tunnels and then eventually move westward. And again, this would be middle mile. Um, we would provide the information highway. We want the private sector providers to ride it, okay? This is not a data coaxial copper-based system. This is new, modern fiber. The bottom line is we have benchmarked Hampton Roads to other communities. The facts are that you pay more money for, than other metropolitan regions for slower service. <laughs> That, that, and so, and what we're saying is if we're going to be able to compete, this is a type of modern network that's going to help, um, we think, um, drive 
but being attracted for growth. A, a modern-based uh, fiber optic system could be a huge driver for our community. Now, the first phase, uh, I mentioned phase one was that south side fiber. Uh, our five south side cities got together and they um, contributed money. And what they've come up with here is the design of the general location for the south side fiber ring. It starts here in Virginia Beach. This is the backbone. Uh, goes up through Virginia Beach into Norfolk, um, into Portsmouth, the whole way out to Suffolk, and then comes back around the Chesapeake. Now, this doesn't mean that this is the only area that gets serviced. We want those providers to ride this ring, and then those providers will provide the last mile of service. Okay? Um, now, there's been a number of questions, and, and, and I think there are good questions. I can be honest, I had the same questions when I started with this. Well, why not just let the private sector address this? Um, so, so a couple of a, a, a couple of things. I think that um, again, if you look at our system now, we have slower service for higher costs. Um, our elected officials have heard from businesses. Fast, efficient broadband service is a barrier to our growth. We have heard from our institutions of higher education that the cost of the service is a barrier and it is really holding them back in terms of their research capabilities. Um, we have cities, um, if, if I'm running a business, there's gonna be some areas of our community where you're just gonna get, gonna get the ROI of extending a service, right? They're low density areas or areas of other characteristics. I can tell you that Virginia Beach, the city of Virginia Beach reports that when you go to their public libraries at night, the parking lots are full. We send the children home with Chromebooks to do their homework. Well, while the parking lots are full in the evening at the library is, the parents drive their kids, they park in the parking lot, they're getting access to the wireless that they don't have at home so they can do their homework. That's not a criticism of anybody, you just don't give me an ROI there, right? So we think there's a number of reasons for the, uh, our elected officials believe to take a leadership role uh, of setting out this ring and working collaboratively and cooperatively with the private sector to help provide this service to our region. So this is, this is the 30% design that gives you the general route. Um, we were invited to participate in a smart, National Smart Cities Challenge competition. Um, and um, it, was, it happened out in Cleveland, and there were 69 cities in, in that competition. You see Hampton Roads is a dot in the map, uh, 80 project submissions. Um, we were awarded the top prize nationally uh, because it, it, it was all around this project and the potential for it. What's really galvanized us is um, everybody knows out in the, in, in the um, outlet area there's been tension between our two sister cities, <laughs> Virginia Beach and Norfolk. Kendall and her team were with us this day. We're in Virginia Wesleyan, celebrating the first interconnection of the South Side Fiber Ring between Virginia Beach and Norfolk. Um, and not only do we have Norfolk there standing with Virginia Beach, we have the city of Chesapeake there and, um, um, and our other South Side cities. So this has really brought our, our community together uh, in, in a cohesive way. So we're, we're really excited about the cooperation we're seeing uh, in this regard. Um, what I'd like to do is, Angie, if we could play the video here. We have a brief video, Madam Chair, I'd like to play for everybody, uh, just to provide a little more background, and then we can get into that conversation. I have one more part on governance, and then you're really interested in the feedback. Okay.
workers in the United States right now. We need to make sure that we have the infrastructure that allows our citizens and our companies to compete with all the other companies in the United States. Leaders of Microsoft and Facebook talked about that very same thing at a recent event announcing the completion of a 4,000 mile high speed underwater data cable named Morea that connects Bilbao, Spain and Virginia Beach. This is part of the infrastructure of the 21st century. We actually live in a time where broadband has become a necessity of life. It has become the future of farming with precision agriculture. It is the future of healthcare with telemedicine. It is the future of education with distance learning. It is the future of job creation. At Facebook, our mission is to bring the world closer together. And to do that, I mean, connectivity is key. To help make broadband a reality, chief information officers from all five South Side cities formed a regional broadband task force to create a vision for a connected Hampton Roads. Fiber and connectivity is a must-have in the technology age that we are in. And to survive, municipalities have to band together to make sure that we make this happen. The regional broadband connectivity is strategically divided into four phases. Those four phases being the south side fiber deployment, the peninsula fiber deployment, the connection between the peninsula and the south side, and then any outlying jurisdictions after that. The benefits of regional connectivity are numerous. It's really important that we come together as a region for broadband <coughs> for a variety of reasons, uh, for uh, economic development reasons, for the issues of shared services, and also for the issue of safety and public safety. Uh, having abundant, affordable, ultra-high speed internet is going to be very important when trying to attract new corporations to our area. It's also important for startup companies. Uh, we have to make sure that internet is very affordable so that all of our citizens, all the companies in this area can compete. Without broadband, our future is limited. Having a broadband brain, it's a starting point. If we don't have that, we won't even have the opportunity to entertain discussions with um, small, medium, or large organizations. It is a must-have for most new companies that have anything to do with technology. We need to make sure that when we educate our children that go off to college, we need to make sure that they have opportunities right here at home. And that's why this is such an important project. It's a great opportunity and, and a really, really important opportunity to connect all of the higher education institutions together with K-12 and all public safety institutions. It will facilitate research across the world. It will help with talent development across the region to address the needs for high-speed internet access to all of the educational institutions as well as the businesses in our service area. Support for this project is region-wide. The Hampton Rose Planning District Commission is made up of 17 localities and 1.7 million people who comprise the metropolitan area. I am pleased that all 17 localities supported this initiative. I am excited that all of our jurisdictions wholeheartedly support this and that we are going to work together with our neighboring communities and make sure that this important initiative is supported. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. So I'll just wrap up very quickly, Madam Chair, with a, a little bit of information on the proposed governance. Always the scary thing about the you don't know what that next thing is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, sorry. You ever wonder what it's like? <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> uh, so, very quickly, um, so for the Southside Fiber Ring, we have had a broadband steering committee formed by our localities providing oversight. I mentioned the 30% design complete. The next question was, how do we set up a governance structure and a decision-making authority? And the gentleman asked, what, what's the cost going to be for a private provider to ride it? And that, this will be the group that will need to make those decisions, right? So the, the answer to that is to be determined based on this authority. The authority has been approved by the five south side localities. It will start in the south side with the ability to expand to other localities. Um, it's before the SEC for approval. We hope to have that by the end of the month. Uh, the authority, uh, we are completing a request for proposal for final design and construction. Uh, we had a, uh, the PDC is doing that on behalf of the Southside Networking Authority. Um, the scope of work for that RFP is all posted on our website and 
Um, if you're interested in those materials, be happy to get those to you, along with all the reference materials. We did a pre-proposal conference um, in December. We're really pleased we had the whole table where you usually meet was full. People coming in, they're interested in bidding, they're interested in designing. We expect that we might even have some of the local providers have told us informally that they might be proposers as well, right? Um, so that, that's an exciting opportunity. So um, those bids are due, those proposals are due January the 23rd. And from there, um, this Southside Network Authority that includes the five member cities, Chesapeake, Norfolk, Portsmouth, Suffolk, and Virginia Beach, um, to give you an idea, Rosemary Wilson, who's appointed by Virginia Beach, um, Andrew McClellan from Norfolk, um, Patrick Roberts, the city manager from um, Suffolk, Daniel Jones, the chief information officer from um, Portsmouth, and I know I'm going to, uh, Chesapeake is Ms. Susan Vitelli from the uh, city council. Um, so they'll be the group that will be making these decisions about the parameters for people to ride uh, that ring and ride that fiber network. Um, so, Madam Chair, um, that's where we are with the project. Um, people always ask me, when could you start seeing construction? If I could play that out just to conclude. If we could get this contract issued this spring, they tell me the design works probably a six to nine month effort. So let's call it ten. <laughs> we all know how that works, right? But that probably puts us next year at this time that we'll say, here's the final design. Here's the cost. Here's how that cost would need to be financed so that we can hopefully be looking in that 2021, 22, 22 year of starting construction of the ring. So with that, I'll stop and look forward to your conversation. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I'll start here. Yes, Robert. Uh, I'm concerned that you, you alluded to an open archi architecture, and I'm hoping there's some guarantees of that. Example, we had Cox out in Suffolk. We cut cable about four years ago. It was poor service, the costs were constantly uh, going up. Uh, there's no control on cost because there was no alternatives. Mm -hmm. and, and we just said, it's not worth it. So, you know, we, we got our internet out of the way, but Cox, as far as TV and stuff, is gone. <coughs> so, the first private se uh, sector companies that come into this ring have any ability at all to control who else gets in? You know, barriers to competition, lobbying, or whatever? So it's, it's, a great, it's a great question. The concept here is to increase competition, right. to be honest, in, in the marketplace, right? We see it as, um, and even the incumbent <coughs> provider has told us that, you know, they, they welcome competition. They, you know, it's not something that they discourage. Um, but the idea here is as many, um, the, the more options you have, we, we think the better it, for everybody. it is for everyone. So, I don't want to be disingenuous and stand here and say, Mr. Mears, it's going to be exactly this, because I'm not on the authority board and I won't make those decisions. But the concept here is more options is going to be good for everybody in our region and community. So, so we as a body could say we want more options and don't give it just one. That would be the type of, some of the guiding principles that you would like the authority to consider, that's exactly the type of input we're here looking for. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody? Anybody else? I'm, I'm just going, I'm going around. I'm going to sweep. <laughs> 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 so, okay. like, I'm not smart on this data either, but if Richmond could come down and run the cable from their, to the, their business park near the airport, and evidently they've already done that, why can't we Cox or somebody run one to say every one of these TCC community centers and just build something there. Why, I mean, why can't that happen practically? Well, I, I can't speak on behalf of the private provider. Um, I can just speak on behalf of the, the people that I work for believe that by the private sector building this ring, um, we, we, we can ensure that we're, we're going to have that happen. It's going to happen in a timely manner, and it's also going to bring other private entities in and give them the ability to, to ride the ring. Um, I think that you know I, I know that the existing providers going to be very interested in, in, in riding this ring. Um, the other thing I can say is that for your local governments, just building this ring and interconnecting to their own operations 
Um, the estimate uh, for the South Side School Districts alone is going to say three million dollars the first year. Okay, and it could be more than double that when you add in the other government operations. Okay, um, and that's just before you even start talking about, you know, what, what we're really about here is. Could, could this, you know, we're going to talk about the brand image of this region next, you know, could this be the type of futuristic thinking community that with this ultra-fast fiber starts to attract your creative companies and your high-tech companies and those businesses of the 21st century, you know, it's hard to even quantify what that could, could, could mean for the region and for the community. But, sir, I, I just can't speak on behalf of the private providers. <laughs> Um, well, I know how the small businesses have struggled with the fees and the expense of internet. Um, as a former small business owner, the fees literally were tripled than it was for a residential, than it was for uh, a, you know, a commercial. So I'm hoping that that gap is going to shrink considerably with what you're talking about doing. That's my first point. But the other thing is, so who's going to own this thing, once it gets laid and they're going to buy into it, who owns it and who maintains it? So it will be owned and maintained by the authority. So that Southside Authority Board. Okay, so it's going to be all the communities. That, that's correct. All right, now given the size and how much square footage or mileage each locality has, they could have a bigger portion of the maintenance responsibility. So that's a great question because part of what the authority board has identified and that they're going to have to deal with is this. Um, do you fund and operate this like we do for, say, the HRT system, mm -hmm. right? Which is all about miles in your locality, and then you get to the border, and then it's somebody out. Mm -hmm. We've seen that that doesn't work real well. Let's be very, you, you've talked about that, mm -hmm. right? So those are going to be hard conversations that those elected leaders are going to have mm -hmm. to have, that I can't make that decision that I will say. You're right, again, these are great questions. You're right on target that that's going to be a fundamental question we have to answer and a policy that authority is going to make. Okay. Um, you know, if it's going to be a regional system. Everybody that, pays the same? Is, it is sure? one option. Of course, others will say, well, if there's more in Virginia Beach than there's another. There's another. So, you know, but, but those, are, those are important policy decisions that will have to be made. Right. Okay. My other question is, you mentioned Henrico and Northern Virginia wanting to come down and tap into that. Mm -hmm. Is that expense for them to come down and tap into this, is that going to be on their own, own onus? Or are, we, are you talking about there might be a future where we're public-private partnershiping with them to tap in? No, they've done that on their own expense. Okay. Now, let, let me say, they're riding other entities, right? It could be Lumos, it could be whoever they're, they're coming down and getting that service from, mm -hmm. uh, down in Virginia Beach. And the break is done, it's, it's there. It's up at White Oak Industrial Park. Okay. I'm so, just curious if the committee that you're yes. forming with the localities that mm -hmm. you just mentioned, if there's going to be some kind of language futuristic that now they're, yeah, we're, we are going to help you tap into this because we didn't get the money we thought we would, so we're going to need to pin, spend more money to get more people to tap in it so that we have the money we thought we were going to get. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, I'm just... I think, um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Like, I cut down and send it to you. <laughs> no, we send it to them all the time. No, I'm, I'm they don't always I'm listen. I'm quite serious here. They're a little yeah, stiff and yeah. yeah. Usage. Go ahead, Christian. Just like that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Fine. Um, so, so you just, you know, commented that the, the authority kind of owns Ring. Have, have they discussed uh, offering public access uh, since it's taxpayer money, uh, like through like WiMAX or something like that? Those will be conversations. We're an interesting point because the authorities uh, just being for all the localities have approved the paperwork. We should get the SEC approval by the end of the month. Then we'll have the first official authority meeting. I am literally before this before the CAC, and we're talking about some of these issues before they have. But that's okay. You know, this is helpful that you think these are the type of things they need to consider. I, I think you have some officials that are very interested in looking in the possibilities there. Having said that, they've been very clear so far that they don't want to be in the business, right? They're, they're, they're not going to provide that last mile service. But I think when you think about 
how's this relate to 5G and all those other things? Those are things that they want to educate themselves. So to just restate what you just said. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so a public authority funded to taxpayers will own the ring, but that authority is not interested in providing service to the to the citizens. They are. Yeah. They're going to let the private sector ride that ring and set up um, hopefully situations with the private sector that they can provide the last mile in a more cost efficient way, a more incentives affordable way incentives. for our okay. residents, okay. for our businesses, for our higher education. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But there's another element of this yeah. oh, yeah. in that the public entities that are built in the rain are also taking advantage of the ability to communicate with their branches, with their schools, departments and utilities and such without paying the private providers what, what they would have been charged That's correct. for that. There's a cost savings there. So there's another wrinkle in this that just occurred to me. How does it impact the conversation about net neutrality when <coughs> the core of this is public right of way? And that doesn't need an immediate answer. That's mm -hmm. something to throw into the, yes, sir. the pot for future conversation. Be, be, be happy to. Um, the other thing I want to say related to some of the things, uh, Kendall, I'm sure you've had Keith Nichols and others here talking about autonomous vehicles with the CTAP. Yeah. Yeah. So when you think about those futuristic transportation options and choices, again, this is the type of fiber backbone system that could help enable that. Um, you know, I, I talked to Mike and his team, and you know, I'm going to be one of those nervous people in getting an autonomous vehicle. I would really rather it be riding <laughs> and managed by some type of a fiber system uh, such as this. So, you know, there's so many things to think about, and, um, and, and, and I like what Cox Communication advised us about. You know, really the goal here is smart region, smart city, and I think they're, I think they're exactly on to that. I think that's what we're about here, right? We're about Giving people, the private sector the ability to ride the rain, we're about how we do things as smart and efficient as possible and as cost effectively for you all and, and your neighbors uh, to be able to provide the top level smart region, smart city services uh, that, that we want to have to really support Hampton Roads. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, quickly here. First off, kudos, this is, this is right on, this is awesome for the region. Uh, Connectivity is huge. Connectivity for all, even better. But uh, we, 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 we won, won an award, which is fantastic. Did that award come with any resources? Or? So, <laughs> that's so, a great question. Yes, it did. Which, it, and, and you're gonna that, let me start with sort of the end in mind, which we've declined thus far, and I'll tell you why. Uh, a lot of private entities contacted the region oh, okay. and want to be involved with this project, right? We've had to say, well, wait, thank you. We're excited that we got the national award. But a couple of things. Number one, PDC can't make that decision. We needed a governance structure. That's the authority. And frankly, I don't know that the authority wants to give up that equity. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Again, that's not my decision. Um, they need to do, reflect what's going to be in the best interest of all of you in the region. So. A lot of interest, a lot of interest in, in coming and looking at Hampton Roads and hey, we'll build the ring. Of course, you're not going to build the ring for nothing, right? You're going right. to want something for it. And the policymakers are going to have to balance all that. So, so yeah. Um, yeah, so great marketing. <laughs> and and, and, and here. Uh, benchmarking with, with the, uh, other cities, the Northeast has done this dozens of times, and the folks in Florida as well concerning cable termination is a great opportunity to benchmark here and great, great to learn. Our folks in the rural areas and such are, are hurting from connectivity and such. They need to benefit from this. So that authority needs to be equity centered and such. So we uh, need to make sure they understand that. And also uh, on Tuesday, SpaceX just launched 60 more satellites for their internet services. Nice working. They're going to build a, a bridge, basically, 
oh, around the planet in some two thousands since I was which is in direct two competition with this game that's sort of so. Wow. So that's, that's, that's SpaceX? Yeah, yeah, SpaceX. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so uh, anyway, thank you. Okay. Has anybody who hasn't spoken yet? Does anybody else have a comment or a question? Okay, go ahead, we're really great. Two quick things. One, you made great points. One, what about other competition that might be more cost effective and not be the burden on the taxpayers? I love that. Thank you. The other thing is the Eastern Shore being a real rural area, they're still using dial up and they are very much a part of us. And I didn't see anything helping them. Yeah, not yet. Now I will say this. Um, Yes, Eastern Shore is dial up, but they were the first, they formed the broadband authority already. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people aren't aware that that authority ran across the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. That's actually where the city of Virginia Beach Public Schools are getting the broadband service from. They have right now? Major um, that, that was a couple years back. I'm not certain. I'm sure they have a new provider now. Um, but we'll be in contact with them. They're not technically in our region. Um, <laughs> But, but you know we could have those conversations with them. And when you think about Wallops Island and oh, I mean, everything NASA, happening there, hello, yeah. I mean NASA's right there. But again, the what other competition might be accessible that would be more cost effective? So I think that was a great, valuable point. Okay. Well, I would suggest, um, although I review the videos sometimes of the popcorn wine. Um, to see what people have said, so, so I have something to say at, at our regional board meetings. Um, there's been a lot of good input on both of our presentations today, so I would appreciate it if you raised an issue, um, because our uh, audio in here is not so great, and I might not be able to understand what was asked or said, I would appreciate those of you who will take the time and trouble to send me an email about your questions and, and your points. It would be very, very helpful to me if you would do that because then I, I'm working from data and not just winging it. So um, I would appreciate that from, from everyone here. And thank you very much. This is absolutely fantastic. Thank you for the conversation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now, this is where I would like to interject the bylaws work because I don't expect it to take more than five or ten minutes. Um, are there any objections to that happening right now? Okay. Let's go. Up. So we have yes, there they are. Um, the visuals for this are right in front of us. As I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, uh, Kendall already sent out the proposed the, the draft for the bylaws for the update to our bylaws back in September and again in November. And uh, Carlton gave a, a lot of input. I gave a little bit of input. Uh, we come up with this. This is the latest iteration, and, and this was just this week, so that's why it's up there and you didn't get it in writing. Uh, one of the things that, that came up in our uh, meeting back in January a year ago, which is why I really want to get this done, we've been working on it for a year, uh, is that we wanted to make sure there was continuity. So typically, this the, the membership terms are already have already been approved by the HRTPO and the PDC, um, or they shall be approved by the PDC because they haven't actually looked at these yet. Um, what we're looking at is what we agreed upon at that meeting back in January 2019 was that we were willing to extend our terms to provide continuity and institutional knowledge. So for those people who were on board at that meeting, we have said that we are willing to do this to a point. Some people may <laughs> decide to opt out before three years is up, but the general consensus was that people were willing to put in three years if they really, really wanted to and needed to. Um, so that is just a little uh, addition to the membership uh, requirements here. Are there any comments or questions about this? Uh, go ahead. Were the original members of the original committee 
uh, set up in staggered yes, ways. Yes, yes, so this would be a staggered. So some, some of those folks actually didn't serve three years in their first year. Well, we're talking about serving an additional three years to the regular term. So it's, I, it's three terms total. But I'm saying yeah. two terms, which is the, the successor term limitation, yeah. would be six years. Yes. And some people Four. conceivably could be serving Nine. fewer. No, they yeah, wouldn't yeah, actually yeah. more. Two no, no. It's, it's staggered in the sense that you, the only staggering was from at the very beginning of this organization, they were staggered at the end. Oh, yeah, so that, that staggering has stopped it because it naturally fed into, you know how it works, it, it just naturally feeds in. So what you're looking at is that people who were sitting around that table agreed that they, they might be willing to work nine years, but I know from personal experience that maybe not everybody is <laughs> going to be doing it. Um, it. It really was to make sure that we weren't, like new people were going to come in and we're going, happy birthday, have the PDC on top of everything, until we've worked out how we're going to kind of adjust to the extra workload. So it, it was more about that than anybody reaching for power, as Christian did, did bring this up at the meeting last year. Our, you know, we're, we're changing our own terms. This is not something that usually happens. And there was a little discomfort with that, but basically what we decided is we would, for most people, it's a little bit of a sacrifice. It's not, it's not like, you know, you're sitting here power mad or anything. So, um, if there are no objections to this, could we move on to, I think there's one more. Okay, it's highlighted in yellow. Yeah, just, just move down to the next. Yeah, it's just the effects that they, okay. yeah. Can I say something? Yes. Yeah. I just want to remind us that we are, um, you are, at the, at the um, you know, as a result of the, of, of, your, of, your, of your desire to serve, thank you, but at the appointment of, of your mayor. And at any point, your mayor can swap in, swap out. Can you? you know? Yes. So I see any of the back it's, it's not in, it's not in, but it's been done. So. They still have to be approved by the entire HRT. Yeah, they have, to be, they have to be approved by the PPL PDC. But what has happened ha is midway someone's had to move or leave, sure. and then they move. So even though you have an option to serve for those of you who are part of this, you know, January 2019, that, that additional three years, it does not mean that you have to or will. We also have waiting lists of people who would like to serve. At any point, I might say to someone, I have someone in this county who's been waiting for three years, are you interested in stepping now or not? So that hasn't happened to you, but it has happened to others in the community. So there's a lot of ways that this can go. Really, we're just looking for a continuity, as Terry said, of knowledge and approach that's worked so well with us. Yeah, I know. I know, but I just want to. She's like, leave it alone. Yeah. <laughs> I printed out both so I could compare them. Yeah. So it's hard to do it on the computer. So I was wondering why underneath definitions, metropolitan transportation planning and programming process is not in the new bylaws. That was one. And then um, the membership of the 30 members of the cities, Franklin and the town of Smithfield isn't in the original bylaws, but is in the new one. Is that because the PDC has that's member right. cities that the TPO that's does not? Right. So and that's Smith, why that, that's there. Uh, Southampton and Surrey weren't in the original, but are in the new one also. Yeah. Yeah. So hey, that's a that's 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 that question. What I'd like to do with regards to your question about definitions and fields, go back and look at my notes as to why. I can't answer that. Yeah. And the other thing, we don't have um, in there the months that we're going to be doing it no. like we did in the original, so this is going to be winging it? No. No, the, our dates are set for 2020 already. Partly we're looking at, we have 
six meetings is what we all decided on. Right. Um, and well, the nice. idea is that we're going to check and see, because it's at least six, you know. Yeah. Uh, because we can call a special meeting at any time as long as we get appropriate public notice. It's going to be um, every other? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be every other month? Yeah. Right, right now it is, we haven't. We haven't edited. decided yet. Okay. Well, actually, we got we got up through June. Up the next May. the next meeting is in March, Diana. But I will say to you that um, it's six meetings, and we did provide each of you the list of those meetings. I so did far. get them so far, and mm -hmm. I will provide them again. What we'll do actually before every meeting at your seat will be that. Um, but that's a good point that you make. Okay. The fact that we love this game in violence, but I don't know that they need to be listed in those. I just just the number of times we I did, to, yeah. We just wanted to slow down the violence. I think oh, that's okay. To try to, to try to list specific dates in the bylaws <coughs> becomes a, a bit onerous because you can right. then vary based on when the TPO or the HRPDC is meeting or when they have things coming up that they need. We need to be first so we can provide input. Yeah, it was just that, we, that flexibility. It was just that when we had those dates, I thought that was you know like for that year and then. We didn't know when they were going to be the next year. That was just temporary when we yeah. first did it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just for planning purposes. Yes. And, and at the moment, we're also looking at is this going to work? That's what right. I do. I'm filtering things through and seeing if what is working as we take on these additional uh, duties. So, are there any other questions about <coughs> anything? Comments? No, go ahead. Yeah. I was piggybacking on Diana's question. Was there a change in regions I mean, with, with Franklin, Southampton, and Surrey? It looks like there's a reach further to the north and to the west. Is that intentional or is that as so far that, as members? So remember, if I may, Madam Chair, yes, please. remember for the MPO, they deal with the urbanized area and the area projected to be urbanized on our TPO board. The PDC, we are defined by the Code of Virginia as the PDC region. So that's why you bring in Surrey and Smithfield and Southampton. So we, we include areas in addition to the urbanized area in the PDC for okay. 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 So will we get more SeaTac members for those cities? Yes, not SeaTac. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. It's, a, it's a well, we well, I, mean, I guess uh, I guess this is actually similar because, because now our members are appointed by the mayors of our of our cities, and you know there aren't that many. When you get into counties, are, is it every town in the county gets appoints a body, or just the county, or how does that work, and where is that defined? The chair. The chair.
Well, uh, okay. Anybody want to second that? Second. What was the motion? To to uh, the long presentation. Mm -hmm. for the this is um, apparently part two of the executive director update, which I did not realize, which I apologize for, but I would certainly take that under consideration. Anybody else want to comment on shifting this to the next meeting? Yes. I'd rather hear it now, even, yeah. though, even if it takes a long time, because it, it's an issue that I hear a lot about in the community. And, you know, I, I would like to be informed. Okay. I, I would like to take it too. Um, any other comments? Then I'll take a vote. Uh, all those in favor of moving this on to the March meeting, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. 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 Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we can do a show of hands. Okay. I'm going to do a show of hands so we can really see. Okay. First, people who would like to move to March. Okay, all those who'd like to have it done now, uh, yeah, do it now, as it. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Okay, so I will move as quickly as I can. Some of these slides I'm going to bounce through because I want okay. to be respectful of your time. But so I would like to get across some of the major themes from this. You all recall that CAC was involved very early on in this process when John Martin came in and discussed with you that we were going to embark on a regional branding initiative. And you saw some headlines, and I just want to start off by saying that I, I want to remove some concern caused by the headline um, in, in the Virginia pilot. Um, instead of crossing out all these names at the top of the paper, what we would have preferred is, we call it the real truth, that yes, we are going to start using the 757 as a way to tie us together as a region, but it doesn't mean the coast of Virginia gets crossed off or Tidewater and Hampton Reds. Uh, in fact, nobody has to change their name, right? And we're going to explain why. But what we're really looking for is a regional uniting feature using the 757 to tie us all together. Irrespective of the name of our organization, which of the 17 localities that we um, live in, work in, play in, that the 757 is something that can tie us all together. And I'd like you to tell you a little bit of information why. We just had to throw in there that the news paper didn't read our 10 page report. And that 10 page report, as John Martin promised to you, summarizes 10 key data collection points. There were many, many people involved in this effort, internal to our region, external to our region, the people who live here, visitors, business people residents, young people, old people, people of all backgrounds, um, from ethnic background to race to even income status, was all stratified to come up with what we think is something that everybody shows they, they, they really can get behind. And it's not everybody, but the consensus shows most people can get behind. Um, this is our website, www.envision2020.com. That little report, it's available right here in a link, I would really encourage you to go ahead and click on that and, and read that if you like. In fact, what I'll do when we push that information out with Kevin, we'll push this out to you all and ask if you can read through it. Um, so what I'm going to do is just give you a quick overview um, of this effort. What we're about is how do we best market, brand, promote Hampton Roads? Understanding our brand awareness, what people think about us, and how do we improve our regions positioning, and there were literally thousands of people included in the survey. Uh, myself and Delcino Miles actually served on the task force, um, but we had community stakeholders groups represented. We had 17 young professional groups represented. Um, we had over 2,000 plus meeting hours <laughs> into going through all the data and the information. The media, the pilot helped us here. They pushed the survey through the pilot, through the major TV stations. Dozens of organizations helped us push this out to their audiences. Um, we had almost 3,000 completed surveys. That's all? Well, that, that was just the surveys, but keep in mind that um, 2,000, about 24% response rate, it's pretty good. Um, and, and scientifically, 
they weighted by each jurisdiction and also weighted by socioeconomic background to make certain. So scientifically, it's a valid sample size in each locality. Um, you all know this. Our region's facing a huge challenge. When you look at other regions of our population size, um, we are not doing well. Right? Here's Raleigh, here's Richmond, here's Hampton Reds. These next couple of slides aren't real cheery to look at, but it's sort of important to see where we're at. Um, we need to attract more residents. We've seen a 2.6% population growth since 2010. And you all know the story, since coming out of the Great Recession, the nation's picking up, Virginia's starting to pick up. We've been slow to return to, to where we were pre-recession. Um, migration, here's where we rank in terms of migration for metro areas of one to three million people. So here's Hampton Reds. Well, we're ahead of Milwaukee, um, right <laughs> now, close to Pittsburgh, but you can see we're behind Cleveland, we're behind Rochester, we're in the wrong end of that spectrum. We, we, we gotta do better, right? Um, our projected future growth right now is slow. Um, where Virginia's expected to grow by 2040, where the Richmond region is, 5.6% public services and utilities, we can't keep costs down and maintain the same level of service at 5.6% rate of growth between now and, and 2040. And I think we all know that, right? Something has got to happen if we're going to be able to, um, if we're going to be able to compete. And really the battle is for these young workers. And this is, Joe Martin went through this, I'll go through this for you. But, you know, what we generally knew is a population pyramid. Our population pyramid is getting shoulders, which it basically means there are a lot, we're having fewer children. There are a lot fewer young workforce available in the marketplace, and there's more of us baby boomers, right? Um, urban areas, metropolitan regions, we're in a competition for human capital. We are in a competition for workforce. And it's those metropolitan regions that are going to be attracted to that young <coughs> workforce. Uh, the young generous people from 24 to 40, they're going to be the winners. And, and, and we've and we got to get in that competition. Um, what's it all mean? You know, corporate America had this figured out. Uh, we're sort of late to the game, but you know, they've been writing books about this a long time. Corporate America has got this. Cities are starting to get it. And John Morton talked with you about two models. The first one, I think is ridiculous. <laughs> you, you talked with you about metropolitan regions buying residents. I'll go quickly, but can you imagine? I mean, here's Tulsa. They'll pay you to come work in Tulsa, $10,000 cash, right? Um, and you look at all these, and you can see who they're getting to. Here's a $5,000 incentive, right? You're 28 years old. These numbers are pretty good, right? Um, $15,000 to make the move to St. Clair County. Um, Hamilton will pay college graduates to move there. Um, you know, look, look here, you're talking about successful applicants in the program may receive up to $10,000, $300 per month for 30 months. Uh, Harmony, Minnesota will pay residents $12,000 for new residents. I don't know where Harmony is. Um, for <laughs> one, $10,000. Um, anyway, on and on. I mean, and this is, yeah, right? I mean, you, 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 yeah, you, you, you get it, and you're going to see, but I, and the point is, they're competing for who we're competing for, right? And uh, I don't know that that's sustainable. Now, the other model is you build, you promote a great place, right? The old model is we used to go well hunting, right? You go out and you recruited the big companies, and they came in and built big companies, and the people followed, and the community grew. What more people are doing is they're being more strategic. They recruit targeted industries. They build that great place to live and work that we think we have here. People flock to it, and businesses grow. Um, but when you think about placemaking, it's really about having a shared story and a positive buzz. And right now, we don't have either going on to the degree that it should. There's parts of it, right? But collectively, as 17 localities, um, we're just not doing that. So um, the, the key thing that we found in this is Hampton Roads, we don't really have a naming issue. We have a marketing issue. We really never market ourselves as a unified region. Our 17 localities in the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, we did the research, they spent $50 million. We spent $50 million? 17 localities collectively spent $50 million. What a waste of money. Marketing <laughs> 17 individual localities. 
17 individual localities. And when you so and when you look at our websites, how much mention of the region is here? In Norfolk, it's about Norfolk, right? Not Hampton Roads, not coastal Virginia, not Tidewater. Virginia Beach, nothing about the region. We market Portsmouth, we market all of our units individually. And even our co colleges and universities and large employers, we're not seeing it there either, right? So the consequence is, you know, we have a process designed, we're scientists in a room, right? You design a process to get you your results, right? And the problem is, of the people that responded to some of our survey work from outside Hampton Roads, we gave them a map of Virginia with all the regions. Only 15% could identify us on a map of Virginia correctly, right? It's, it's scary. And, and, and some of the comments people wrote in, we thought that you were the Hamptons in, in, in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, so... <laughs> the other thing we found is, for local residents and business leaders, it was really hard for them to define what Hampton Roads was, or even emotionally connect to it. Here's a resident that said, we asked the residents, which of the following areas in Virginia do you consider as being part of Hampton Roads? Well, your CAC would be a lot smaller, right? People don't view any of these localities below the line as being part of Hampton Roads. And I can't blame them, right? I do this, you know, I'm a government geek, right? I mean, right? But even, um, even when we get to, um, so in residents, um, less than 40% say they identify with the region. I'll bump through some of this. Our business leaders said the same thing. Um, excuse me, Bob. Yeah. Yes. I, pa pa I apologize for that, but I took that survey, mm -hmm. and I don't remember every one of those choices that were on the survey. Like, could you say all of these cities were part of that survey? Those all weren't on there. So I'll, I'll pull that for you, and we'll take a look at that. Okay. Okay, but this is from the, the, the survey data that we received. Um, you know, again, the business, and we'll, we'll look at that. Okay, okay. But the business leaders had, had the same reaction as our residents. So when we ask business people what's the greatest challenge facing them as business leaders, this is what they told us. And this is hard for someone like me to look at, right? Um, regionalism, transportation. <laughs> Mike, keep that hits home, right? <laughs> For us, right? Yes. Um, and then we ask the, the other thing that we found, and I'm sorry, I'm just bouncing through as quickly as I can. Sure. We really found if we launch a new name now, we're going to divide the region even more. And, and here's why Coastal Virginia and Hampton Roads have equal but opposite support. <laughs> what our survey respondents found was residents prefer Hampton Roads. Businesses prefer coastal Virginia, right? They both were, and, then, and neither one of them are a wrong answer, right? So how do you pull that together? And, that, and that's what we're trying to get at and do. So what we felt is right now, we don't need to change names. What we need is a unifying pride building campaign. And that's where we've come with the 757 to be that unifier and that connector. Existing names can stay. We feel we can work that 757 in to Coastal Virginia and Tidewater and Hampton Roads and all of the others. Frankly, it's what was done with the RVA that exploded in Richmond, okay? Um, 757 is already in use today, especially with our young people. It's everywhere. There's like 100 businesses that already have it uh, in Hampton Roads. Um, Norfolk's uh, high school football team won the um, state championship. Their coach talked about when you play for the state title, you pay for all for 757. He's on TV. Uh, 757, our Division One recruits talk about, man, you want to recruit the 757. It's out there everywhere, right? It's just been the nomenclature on social media. That's what we want to try to tap into. Um, 757 is the way that we're finding that people are emotionally connected with the region. And we have a lot of very influential people that are willing to help us with this. And it's really, we think, transformed from an area code to a place brand name. When we did a word cloud, if I may, um, for one second, um, initially we said, well, it's an area code. And what the survey respondent said is, no, very few of them think of it as an area code. This is what they think of it as. It's home, right? It's Hampton, it's the beach, it's Virginia Beach, it's Norfolk. Yes, sir, I didn't mean to. But, yeah, but we don't control that. When we run out of 
seven digit numbers, it's going to split. There's already talk about it. Split. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we, we, um, we consider that, and what it goes back to is, again, this slide. The people that are using this aren't using it as an area thing, right? The RBA, you know what RBA started with? One said, right? Now it's four of the nine. Now it became nine of the nine, and if that is starting to spread the word chart, it's just something they use as, a, as an identifier, right? Most people that responded to our survey do not think of the 757 as an area code. They think of it as a way of life and a place that they connect to um, emotionally. Um, what we'd like to do, we think everybody can use it in a non-threatening way. And again, you're not changing your name, but there's ways to work it in. Uh, originally, they created an RBA creator. Here we could have a 7 by 7 creator that you can go online, you can slide your own photograph in. It's open source. We want you to make your own graphic so that it ties in to what you emotionally feel about the area. Communities can simply start working it in on their website. Kendall's already worked it into an active transportation logo, working with Rob Cofield. It looks fantastic. Um, you know, it's a way that we can start telling our story. And the good news is we have some friends that are willing to help us with this. Now, this was really interesting. Again, I apologize for moving quickly, but I just like, I want to get to uh, the video that Pharrell Williams helped us with. This is the social media buzz leading up to something in the water, right? And of course it came back down, but look what it did as compared to pre, right? Yeah, it came back down, but boy, it stayed up there, right? Yeah. And it shows what starts to happen when people start, you know, getting excited and pushing this. Pharrell Williams reached out to us through his team, and we've had a couple of one uh, meetings with him um, in Virginia Beach. Um, and his staff, and we're working out a way that he's going to help us with this. We don't have all those arrangements finalized yet, but I got to stress it's more than Pharrell Williams. It's Mike Tomlin and it's other people that are willing to help us with this. Pharrell was, said, you know what, we've got to figure out this relationship, but here's what I'm going to do for you. So what we're going to, and these are the famous people we have from the 757. Um, what I'd like to bounce to is the video um, that Pharrell did for us. And then, uh, Madam Chair, I, just to be sensitive of time, I'll open it up to comments. Uh, we could go through more, but I know we've been at this a while. But can we play that, Andrea? By the way, thank you to Andrea for helping us with all this. This regional branding effort is inspiring. Not just the idea of treating our region like a true brand, but the process. It is rooted in all the ideas and potential felt for this region. What we could achieve together has the power to uplift us in unprecedented ways and play an important role in charting our future. It is forward thinking. Forward momentum is essential. <laughs> this is not an effort designed to maintain status quo. This is an effort to galvanize the region in a powerful cycle that at once distinguishes us from other regions, unifies us, and celebrates us. All in the name of growth and opportunity for everyone. We are elevating our distinctive excellence. We will unify in a show of regional pride. We will let culture guide us and celebrate that culture in a way that makes us magnetic. The most successful business and political leaders of tomorrow are the ones that understand this today. Relating to young people is all about business. Day in and day out, the importance of the young people might not always be top of mind. But it only takes a second to realize we are nothing without them. They are a vital part of our family. They're a vital part of our fabric. But it's not just about our young people. This is about the young people we know they draw here. When we signal to the nation that we are truly inclusive, and especially when we connect our younger citizens, then corporations and others will take notice. Now is our time to show all young people that we see them. We're here for them and uniting as a region largely for them and their future. It is the right thing to do. When it comes to effectively branding this region and telegraphing our story far and wide, let's simply double down on what we are as citizens, as people, unanimously refer to the region as already. It's been in front of us all this time. The data, even the hashtags, tell the story we all know. The 757. It's bold, it's modern, and it's uniquely representative of us all in our beautiful diversity. Other names might be geographically descriptive. Those names 
Greatest represent where we've been. But only the 757 is 100% inclusive of all of us and rooted in what is undeniable about us, our culture. Culture attracts. Culture unites. Culture distinguishes. Something in the water was the culture of the 757 put on display. Global brands and media showed up for it, and it's only getting bigger. It beautifully represents all 1.7 million of us. We are the 757. I am from the 757. I'm from the 757. I work in the 757. My business was in the 757. We are the 757. I am the 757. So I just wrap up by saying, our this came first. Pharrell's team did this in a league, and, and um, when we got it, and Kendall and Keith and Mike saw this, right? When we got it Tuesday morning, um, we had Pharrell's Pharrell's voice talk was, was the, the talk of everybody else was going through the cinema. It was Pharrell talking. We thought it was too distracting, right? We thought it came better hearing from everybody in your individual voice. So, so Madam Chair, I'll just say that you know. This is like anything. There's there's a lot of right answers and there's wrong answers. And is this the only right answer? We you know it's not, right? Um, but what we're hoping is that this is one we can get from our own CD Um It's um, I'll be honest, and I'm not ashamed to say this. It took me a while to warm up when I was in Richmond RBA, <laughs> a little bit. Um, but I think that um, you know our hope is that this is something we can continue to discuss as a community. We're already seeing the social sentiment excitement is is going up on this, and um, I just appreciate the involvement of this CAC early on in this and continued conversation with you about how we how we best message. So I'll stop there. Yeah, I'm sorry we we rushed you through, but any comments? Yes. Yeah, I see you, but I'm going around. Go ahead and say. I don't want to say. You know, be, being in the military, on my personal Facebook page, right? I have friends from all over the United States, and I put on there when this came out. If I told you to come to the 757, would you know where to go? Nobody knew. They all have my phone number. It starts with 757. <laughs> Nobody knew. They not, not my family, family, not my family. Yeah, they do. <laughs> not my family, not my friends. Nobody. They were like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Old I'd like to make a yeah. comment. Yeah. So, you know, so this is going to be I old school, school that, that, yes. that wanted this. And and that's that, who you're marketing And I think to. that that is something that we need to be cognizant of because a lot of us are going to be retiring. And this even some of us will be working forever. Um, oh, I think just saying, you're marketing it to you. Okay, people. just a minute. I think that what we really need to be cognizant of in this region is that we need young blood here. Because we are not going to, we will not provide the tax base ourselves to keep the stuff going. Okay. And we really need to be aware of what attracts younger people. And this happens to be one of those things that apparently works. And I think that it isn't that you can't say you're from Virginia Beach or Hampton Roads. It's that this is just another catch. You are not going to keep people here without jobs. Seven five seven is not going to keep people here That's right. without jobs. But what jobs? Is the businesses are supporting it, and the, one of the points, you know, go ahead, John. Well, I, I just want to, I guess my missing link is, who actually voted and made the decision to go with 757? Yeah. It's not that I disagree or agree with it, it's yeah. just... So what you have right now is this is consensus of the community task force and a list of community stakeholders that we had up on the screen. Um, really, for this to work, it's no authoritative group or person that says this. This is something that you're going to see a push out from all of those organizations. And just like the RBA, the hope is that it's a community adopts it. Because to be honest, um, you know, if you wanted to kill this real quick, it'd probably be put on the Planning District Commission agenda and vote, force a vote yes or no. Because if you voted yes, you take all the coal factor out. Right? Um, so to answer your question, this is a group of community <laughs> stakeholders in the task force that's suggesting it and is going to start pushing it and hope the community picks it up and takes it. The only way it works is if it's organic. And Ms. Howard, to your point, if, if it doesn't draw the emotion that we think it does, then it's not the right choice. But 
the data suggesting that people have a connection to this. So we're hoping this is something we can turn over to the community and, and the community will take forward. Future Hampton Roads is printing out 10,757 stickers. You're going to start seeing popping up in other organizations. You're going to start doing that too. And um, people are talking about group rallies to get behind this, but that's what we want. It's got to be the community's, not ours. Okay, thank you, Carlton. Yeah, I, I remember when they went with the Hampton Roads community uh, nomenclature, and I know in different news, it was years before the sign said, entering different news, a Hampton Roads community. And yet the term had been around probably five, six, seven, eight years. So this isn't going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen overnight. I'm not really thrilled with it either. We're getting, <laughs> now wait a minute, we're getting a new area code that has already been announced. Mm -hmm. Us older people, we hear 757 is an area code. Well, that excludes Gloucester. They're 804. Mm -hmm. We are a very mobile population here, so we have probably half the area codes in the country represented here. So if my area code is Hawaii, Honolulu, 808, this doesn't include me. So I don't know. I, I, I don't have any, they can go either way. I will still call it Hampton Roads, Tidewater, Coastal Virginia. I, I did object to the one comment. He said that those terms were where we were. This is the new thing. And I'm thinking, no, did you move away from Coastal Virginia, the Atlantic Ocean is still there. But having grown, having grown up in Williamsburg, that doesn't surprise me they're below that line. <laughs> Williamsburg, they're not part of Tidewater. They're not part of the peninsula. They are unto themselves. <laughs> Amen. Just that's just their mindset. Well, they always have been. You know, so that's not likely to change. Okay, exactly. So, I won't respond to opinions about 757. I'll just respond to something factually, though. And, and I mentioned this uh, at a meeting once with a couple of people from your company in Williamsburg who said that, you know, when's the last time that the South Side helped them? And are they part of the region? So I asked them if they enjoyed driving the new Interstate 64. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, which they absolutely did. And as Howard, I let them know that Virginia Beach is paying 45% of that. Thank so, you. So, um, Yay us. Just what it's, <laughs> so what, what, I, what I say is this. I think people in my position, and this is a criticism of myself, we have to figure out how to better tell the story of how localities are cooperating so Williamsburg feels apart. Yeah. And vice versa. I agree. Does that make sense? We're going to have to get over here yeah. with the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. That's right. Thank <laughs> 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 you for that. I just want to say that. Yeah, it's true. There's a 757 Bridge Tunnel. Well, <laughs> 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 just saying. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> marketing strategies. I, I love marketing. I love branding. It, it's just fun to do. Period. I just, that's a, my a glitch. That's my jam. I love to do that stuff. Um, in the overall scheme of things, I, I mean, I agree with her. I agree with this gentleman in regards to what's going to be catchy for the indigenous here that are going to want to support that. Um, bottom line, if we don't have these jobs, that are here to sustain paying somebody $10,000 bonus because you're under 30 and we want you to come work here. If we don't have that job that the government or the localities are having to subsidize, it's, it's all for naught. I mean, you can brand all day long, but what's, and you can, 10,000 is gonna run out if you don't have the job to sustain it, you know, so. I appreciate all of the efforts, and, and I love marketing, by the way. I think it's just fun. But if we don't have the foundation to sustain this, it, it's irrelevant. So thank you, Pharrell, for making an irrelevant point, because we don't have the foundation to sustain it. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Just saying. Well, we're also dealing, if we go back to the first part of Bob's presentation, the regional broadband initiative, there is an obvious 
point here. Right. We are trying to attract new industry. We have Amazon. It's in Northern Virginia, but it's in Virginia. Right. And, and the point is that they have some of these Yes, 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 that is true. So, so we're looking at at ways of, of tacking on to, to the technological advances that we're making in infrastructure. And, and I, I just keep harping back, I know, to the idea of a younger generation coming here and creating some of those jobs. Because one of the things that we have are a lot of, of young people who are starting up their own businesses because yeah. they can't get jobs elsewhere either. Right. And, or they don't want to go elsewhere. They want to stay where they are. And they, they are, I know, I have a daughter who's doing that. So it's, it's one of those things where we're not just we're just not just attracting people to jobs that are already here. We are attracting people to create new jobs. Big companies, small companies, and little people making themselves bigger. Well, and uh, just to retort, yeah. and first of all, amen, because I agree with you yeah. completely. I, com I completely agree with you. And I would like to point out a strategy since we talked about NASA on the eastern shore and that what might need to be cultivated with some of the businesses that want these younger people to come and start to rejuvenate the area, if you will, if we're lost rejuvenation, whatever you want to categorize it with. But they've created a great ecosystem with NASA. If you've never taken the tour over there, you are missing a tour because the way they work with their community and cultivate with right from the local high schools to keep people there on the eastern shore and to get them to want to do math and to become engineers and to get those six-figure incomes by working with NASA they do it right from the localities before these kids even I mean leave high school they are cultivating that and I would encourage us as a region to reach out to our business partners because look at what they do at the shipyard in cultivating uh, people to come to work for them and stay there and the programs, the, in, uh, the apprenticeship programs that they start at the shipyard to get people there and to keep them. And I actually asked the shipyard, 95% stay in that job. And I took they're the tour. TCC too that's, at the high school. That's right. Yeah. So 95%. There, there again, Waverly, we're talking a local push, a local marketing, right. not a regional marketing. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sorry over. that the um, the new landing of the cables didn't enter into or find some kind of uh, nomenclature here. Um, no wonder. <coughs> Coastal Virginia. We don't teach geography in the schools, <laughs> right? But that, to me, would have been a business attractor more than anything else. Yeah. But that's relatively new. Maybe that wasn't aware when they were doing the study. Who knows that, by the way? Quick, quick yeah. So, uh, Facebook and Google are the partners of this You know, it's, it's all about the bottom line is about attracting new talent, young people uh, with, with strong will and intellect and want to contribute to the region. You know, if it ain't lit, if it ain't fresh, you know, if it ain't hip, we're not gonna get them. We're not gonna get them. They're gonna go elsewhere. They're gonna go to Atlanta, you know, where, where they have 50 morales in Tyler Berry, you know, and where it's fresh, lit, lit and lit. Okay, that's the reality. You know, they come out of all of these great schools, Berkeley, Harvard, Princeton, of all these great, great degrees. But if this region ain't hip, lit, and fresh, you know, they, they're going elsewhere. You know, so, so, so we've got to grasp that. That's the reality. Okay. Well, I think we went. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Mike, you wanted to say something? Oh, I yeah, just want to kind of place off of what Mr. Lewis said. You know, the one thing that Bob had to kind of slide by quickly in his presentation was this idea of placemate. You know, when you showed those two different ways of, of, uh, of developing areas, bringing people to the areas. The old way being you, you attract the business there, and then you attract the workers there, and then they, they come to your area. The new way being you make the place someplace people want to be. You get the good, talented people there, and then that attracts businesses there because that's where the talent is now. So 
I think you make some good points in terms of, of jobs. Um, it, parts of what we're doing, I think, are trying to, to help make this place someplace people want to be. So $5 billion of transportation improvement pro, uh, projects that help make it look like we're here. You can get here, you can move around here, we can get freight in and out of here. This is a, it's better for that. You know, we're, we're working on a regional transit plan to make the transit better in Hampton Roads. Uh, that seems to be a big, important issue with a lot of younger folks. Uh, the fiber rain, you know, this high-speed fiber, that's going to be another thing, you know. The, the, the younger folks want to come to places that have high-speed internet. So we're doing some things that are going to make this an area where it's, we're doing a place making. Some, some other pieces that have to happen are uh, in the school systems, you know, training the people to be able to do those kinds of jobs that you're trying to attract to your area. So there's a population here you know, that, that's capable of doing those jobs. Because a lot of times what happens is you bring in a high-tech uh, company, and they have to bring employees in from outside of the area because we don't have necessarily the people treat, you know, trained that's in right. that here. So it's going to be a lot of, it's, it's, it's more than just a, a brand. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to be making the place someplace people want to really be. And I think once we get there, it won't really matter what it's called or what the brand is. When people are going to know where it is because it's going to be one of those places that you've, they, you've created a foundation that's going to support it. Right. And it's, it's not, and it's not only those things, but also the cultural stuff. Nice parks, places people can hang out. It's more than you know. These days, people are looking for a lot more than just a job with a good paycheck. They also want to have something that's great to do with the family after work mm -hmm. and things like that. Well, it's all a whole package. And that's why. It's, it's kind of a new thing for a lot of us to think about in terms of placemaking as opposed to just go out and see if you can attract another big employer. Mm -hmm. You see something like Amazon's interested, let's go for that. But we didn't make the place here for the kind of, we didn't make the place here for the, for the people that like to work at Amazon to want to come to. You know? So it's, it's going to take a lot of work. I think we've got a lot of stuff going on already with transportation, the high-speed internet, and some things like that. Uh, education, we, we need to work on, I think. But it's really getting, getting down to making that place, you know, the place where these folks want to be. And then I really feel like, like Mr. Harris is saying, that, you know, when, you're, when you have that place that people want to be, you're going to get those talented people there. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to help bring the businesses that we want to get here, and, and the kind of high-tech jobs. Uh, so this is a piece of working on it, you know, and, I, and I think it's, it's an important piece, but uh, there's a lot more to be done. I should point out. Thank you. Um, Bob, just one quick question for you. This presentation, is it available for us to look at the whole yes. thing? On, Absolutely, uh, yes. Uh, so that, if, if, yeah, that, that would be, I think, mean, public. Can I let you get them a 10 page synopsis too of all the survey? Absolutely. Okay, okay, go ahead, Jordan. This is the I'm, last, last thing here. <laughs> I think Mike's got a, 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 a brilliant point that we, we have predatory cities when you're talking about small businesses. They look at them as another tax, another permit, they delay them, they don't incentivize them. They you know, they go after the big guys and look at you know the movie, the little pink house, Pfizer, you know, we're gonna redevelop the, the entire little city in Connecticut. That never happened. They condemned all the area and whatever, and they had ten years worth of incentives. As soon as their ten years of incentives, they were gone. And that's what the little ones are. If you if you incentivize, you know, the only way to get like uh, NASA and Wallace and Noah are my clients when I was with the Army Corps. There's only two places to work up in that part of the, of the upper out banks. Tyson's chicken, NASA and Noah. That's it. <laughs> so that's I mean, a you big pay I mean, they want, if the pays are good, you can go in there. Makes it a real easy. But if, if the city would stop growing, their staff and start incentivizing small businesses. They have GIS, you know, every city has a GIS center, and none of them know what they're doing. As soon as they know what they're doing, an AD picks them up because they're worth something at that point. What, you know, all they need is one or two GIS managers in the city, and they need to have, you know, contracts, uh, ID, I, IQ, five years. You come in, you provide us services, give us all our, and it's a loft industry, three or four people that grows to nine people, that grows to 12 people, to whatever. They all start paying taxes. 
They all get good. If they do a good job, they get the next year's contract. If they do a good job, they get the next year's contract. And they can grow, you know, the small businesses are the ones that will take off. Not the, the big businesses, throwing your money at big businesses. They'll take off, but they take off. <laughs> 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 they, they take off too. <laughs> well, but I just way. feel like we need to okay. pay our own. We need, yeah. Okay. 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 We, need, uh, we need to get on to an old, new and old business. Okay. And, and I apologize for interrupting, but we are going into our okay. time. Um, I've had two people ask about two things. I mean, we've got an old business. One of them was about street replacement, and we would like a staff update if and when that is And then Cecil had asked about um, getting updates on road projects, if we could, when, when we're here at these meetings. Okay, is, yeah. Is there any other, is there any other old business that? If I may, yeah. to springboard off the conversation we all just had, which was perfect, one of the items we'd like to bring in at the March meeting is a conversation on the startup of a comprehensive economic development strategy, which really fills in a lot of all of this. So everything you were talking about is sort of a perfect warm-up for that okay. conversation. So coming attraction. Okay. <laughs> and any new business? Well, that'll be new business. That'll be new business. Okay, great. Okay. okay. Um, um, we were going to talk about the tolls and that I mentioned with in the beginning. That uh, oh, oh, as as old business. That's oh, right. Old business. Um, <laughs> and, and then um, also, uh, gosh, Wait, the pipeline. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So yeah, those were two things that we didn't get an update on. Okay, you wanted some information about the task force, the tolls task force. Right, right, that he was talking about at our last meeting and, and how that we was have it met again since July. Uh, yeah, we, we um, the task force appointed the chair and vice chair yeah. uh, with me. We we're having some engagement with the secretary, so as soon as we get through that information, we can give you an update on it. Okay, because we, we met in July or August, That's right. and we haven't and met since then. You gave us some work with the state. Exactly, you gave us some assignments to work with the state, which we Doing. Yeah. In terms of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, no plans for that to return to the PMC agenda. No. Um, and I've, been, I've been monitoring. The it. most recent item, real quickly, that you see is the Fourth Circuit Court um, did um, <coughs> move the air quality permit for a um, transfer center related to the pipeline um, due to its impact on adjacent neighborhoods in Union Hill. Um, the concern was that they were concerned Dominion didn't look at the use of an electric um, power for that. Um, Dominion will go back and kind of look at that redesign. So that's hung up in that court. And I know there's conversations going on at the federal level. Where the PDC is, is they just don't have standing. Um, so they're, they're no place. Oh, well, they're waiting for the so motion to clear before we do yeah, anything. The, the planning district, because the planning district commission, even if it would take an action one way or another, has no standing. Mm -hmm. How, however, if we push for them to take some kind of stand, that would be something to think about. So that is something that we could look at. Ultimately. I mean, they, they might not want to do it, but we can be really noisy. So um, with that said, if I have a motion to adjourn. Come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> <Any fits? laughs>